So the question is now we are exactly 10 years after the out, outburst of the financial crisis because we take very often you know, this, uh, the fall of uh, Lehman Brothers which took place in uh, 2008, 15 of September. So we are now on the 17th of September. So we are just at the 10 years, 10 years after. So the question is, what did we learn about the crisis? Did we learn correctly? Did we forget already uh, the reason why we had such a, a long crisis? I am among the economists who think that this crisis is a, is a broader than a financial crisis. It's a systemic crisis, in fact. And, uh, and this crisis is not, is not out, is not finished. So there is, in fact, a contradiction because more, if you read the, specific, the definition of crisis, the crisis is something which is a very strong moment of uh, dysfunction of an economy, of a person, if you are sick, but it doesn't last long. Here, 10 years after, we still are in a situation which can be qualified uh, a situation of, of crisis, or, or as we'll see, we'll see at the end of my presentation, we may think, and many people, and a growing part of uh, people today think that we are going toward a new crisis. So it's, we are really in a very specific uh, situation. Okay, so my um, first idea is to present uh, some simple ideas you are very familiar with, I suppose. The idea is that we are, we are in, a very, in a system, economic system, a global system, which is finance-led, very often called finance-led capitalism. And it's also a global system. In other words, we ca if when we think about the economy, in particular about finance, today we, ca we cannot think only on local, regional, national terms. We have to think in, in global terms if we want to understand what's going on. Okay? And uh, according to me, and this, these ideas will be helpful for the, the rest of the presentation, in fact, we have at least two major consequences of this global system dominated by finance. The dominant actors, because we have to think in terms of the strategy of the actors, the dominant actors of, uh, of the system are the global banks, which are very powerful, in particular in a country like France. Uh, also institutional or international investors, we call that sometimes them institutional investors, which are very powerful in countries like the US, Okay, and also central banks became major actors in the regulation of the whole system during the post-crisis the post -crisis period. Okay? So I will focus mainly on these different types of actors. Okay? And I, I belong to the say Keynesian economists uh, or regulationist economists. We call them in France and in particular in Paris 13, where we are a lot of colleagues who are in this school of thought. Uh, we think that we are in a very instable financial system and this instability is systemic. It is linked to the way the whole financial system, economic system is working today. Okay? And this means that we need, of course, new forms of regulations. And the question is, we are going to talk about now, the, the problem we are going to address is, did we learn the lessons to reform the system in such a way that we had systemic reforms? Or did we make only very marginal, uh, weak reform? This is the whole problem today. So my lecture will be in three parts. The first part is, uh, first, what are the major lessons of the crisis by themselves? Of course, I will focus on a, a limitative list of uh, problems. So you have a huge number of problems co pro provoked by this crisis, but I will focus on five series of problems, as you will, we will see in a moment. Uh, I, will, I will present the, the major reforms which took place to in, in view of improving uh, financial regulation and uh, trying to, uh, to have a more stable system, financial system. And I will spend time also in talking about the future of financial regulation, because now we are in a very decisive time where we have to important decisions have to be taken, and I'm not sure they will be taken in the short run, but we will talk about that. In doing that, I will uh, talk as an economist, but also as a doing, we need to do what we call science politic, political science, because in fact, as we'll, we'll see, and I'm sure you know about that, all these questions of regulation are 
uh, affecting conflicting interests among actors, private actors, government actors, and so on, and even countries. So to understand what's going on, we have to, take into, to bring into the picture the behavior of all these types of actors. So we cannot behave in a, only in a very narrow, defined economic analysis framework. We need to broaden the, the framework, and this is what I will, try, I will try to do. OK, so first, what did we learn from the crisis? At least five major lessons. One is that one of the causes of the subprime crisis in 2007 and 8 has been the deficit of financial regulation. It, all, today, all the majority of people, politicians, academics, professionals, regulators, agree that we had a deficit of financial regulation. This, was not, this view was not dominant before the crisis. But the crisis changed the mind. And now they were, it was said that, of course, there was a problem of deficit of regulation. It's important to remind that because you'll see that this lesson maybe has been forgotten today by some people, some of the authorities and even the professional. Now, one of the, one of the major um, regulating body, at least at the international level, has been what we call the Basel Committee for Banking. You know. So I will focus on what this committee has been, the role it has played, which has been a very ambiguous role, positive role, but also very uh, perverse role to some extent. And we have to understand what has been the role of this international body. The third point is the role of central banks. As I said, central banks have became, really become very important actors. Oh, by the way, I will s send you this, uh, of course, this point, point tonight on your address. So you don't have to take to note all what I say in terms at least what is on the PowerPoint, because you will have it in, uh, tonight. OK? So the role of central bank is something very, very important. OK? And to do that to, to a large extent, this has been maybe the major field where significant progress has been made, although, you know, this uh, progress has been also as, as having perverse effects <coughs> on the working of the system. OK? Uh, one of the aspects which has been very important in this question of in the crisis is what is the responsibility of banks, of shareholders of banks? Do we have to save the banks to give them money, public money, government money, or not? So this is a question of what we call bail out versus bail in bank. Should we bail out the bank using public government money, or should we bail them in using shareholder money? Okay. And the th fifth point, which has been very much discussed, at least in Europe, uh, in some other countries also, but mainly in Europe, maybe, is the question of the separation of retail and investment banking. Uh, and maybe uh, the reference here is what happened in the US in the 30s after the Great Crash with the Glass-Steagall Act, uh, implemented by the, by the Roosevelt administration. Yes? Where do you insert uh, financial taxes or taxes on financial transactions on that deficit of banking or financial regulation, or would you add this as an extra point? I will talk about that. Uh, you when know, you in a I will, yeah, I will talk. But you please come come back to that because it's an important issue. But I won't I won't stress that question. But I will I will mention it in a moment. Yes. Okay. Thank you for this question. Yes. But like, uh, taxing financial transactions is not regulation. Like yes, it can it can be both. No, it can be viewed as a financial regulation. Tobin, the Tobin tax is a financial regulation tax. Tobin wanted to stop or to refrain speculation, which was seen as one of, of the cause of the instability. So yes, to that extent, financial transaction tax can be seen as a way to, sp to regulate the financial system. But to, to some NGOs, for instance, now, nowadays, uh, FTT, financial transaction tax, is viewed as a mean to to get some more money to finance international programs to fight against poverty, to fight against some international disease, and so on. But in fact, uh, I would say that, yes, according to Keynes, because the first person who talked about the financial transaction tax was Keynes in the 30s, the last century. Uh, and uh, then Tobing in the, eight, in the 70s mentioned that to stop the speculation on the currency, on the dollar in particular. So it can be viewed, as a, according to me, as a, an instrument 
to fight speculation and stability. Hence, it is an instrument for regulation. Yes? OK? But please, these this are good questions. If you are not, my, question, my answers are not in complete enough, we'll come back to that. It would be a pleasure for me to come back to that. OK? Now, this question of, of a deficit of banking and financial regulation. I mentioned just af after the crisis what Mr. Jacques de la Rosière, who was f at the head of the Banque de France, then at the head of the IMF for a while. This guy is a very, very liberal guy. You know, he thinks that markets should regulate by themselves. And this guy came with a statement, with a report, you know, saying that the crisis has been caused by a deficit of financial and banking regulation. It shows that among the elites, among the, the supervisors, they took you know, the conscience of the fact that regulation was important and there was a, a, an insuff insuff de deficit of regulation. Uh, the idea also was that we went too far uh, on deregulation, financial deregulation. There was a majority of people uh, after the crisis in the 2010, about that, that period of time, who would agree with that. Even liberal people were in favor of letting the market work by themselves. Okay? So the conclusion was that there is no invisible end on financial markets, at least and in, in, at the international level in particular. The market efficiency hypothesis can be criticized because its conclusion is that the financial markets are going to converge to a stable equilibrium state, which is optimal. All these results can be very much criticized because it's a, the, this efficiency market hypothesis is an interesting view because it's a way to represent financial markets, but it is very far from reality. Okay? And in fact, the idea is that the Keynesian view about finance saying that markets are fundamentally unstable is really the more realistic in terms of describing the way markets are working and also the way they should be regulated. Okay? So today, of course, there is always these two ways of representing finance, finance the liberal market efficiency view, which is, by the way, unfortunately, the most important chapter in most uh, finance course in most university. If you go to US university, we, are, we, are, we have made a, a kind of survey about that recently. Or in France, in for instance, uh, universities like Paris 1, Dauphine, which are very supposed to be very uh, up to date with respect to uh, economic theory, in particular with uh, finance, they spend a lot of time presenting this hypothesis and not so much the imperfection of mar financial markets and also why the financial markets are fundamentally unstable. So there is a, I would say, a theoretical, two th major theoretical views. And uh, unfortunately, <coughs> because the crisis showed that they, they are wrong, the market efficiency hypothesis is still dominant in most uh, lec lectures and courses you, know, you can have in, in, in universities. Now, the Basel Committee, I suppose you know what it is. Okay, it has been created in 1974, just after the first systemic crisis, or at least the risk of a big systemic crisis at the beginning, or I say when there was a crisis, uh, the monetary crisis, international monetary crisis, with the, at the end of the uh, Bretton Woods monetary system. In other words, we had, we had at that time floating exchange rates, a lot of speculation, in particular with respect to the dollar, and some banks who took enormous risk speculating uh, against the dollar, lost a lot of money, in fact, because they went too far in the speculation. And there were German banks, US banks, and if the authority did not, would not intervene, they would, would, we may have a, a collapse of the banking system in these countries. So they intervened, but then the authority said, we cannot stay without creating new rules for the banks to push them to be more prudent this has the, the word prudential, to adopt new regulation, to push them to uh, be more careful about risk taking. And the Basel Committee was, was creating then, okay? And there were different steps on the Basel regulation. Basel one in the, let's say the 80s, Basel two in the 90s, and at the, on the eve of the financial crisis, Basel two regulation was just being implemented. And in spite of that, or maybe because of this regulation, which was not so good and maybe perverse, has perverse effects, which I will mention, which I mentioned here, we may, I, I'm among the, the academics 
who think that the role of the Basel Committee regulation has been uh, very uh, uh, perverse to the sense that it has contributed to the crisis, although it was designed to prevent financial crisis. Why, why is it so? Because here we have at least five problems which were discussed and we, we were a minority uh, academics doing, saying that on the eve of the, of the crisis. I would say that already today most people would agree with us. There was the fact that the, the Basel regulations were pro-cyclical. I don't know if you are familiar with this idea of pro-cyclicality. In other words, the, the, the idea is that the major rule of Basel is the uh, on, on funds ca capital ratio of the Cook ratio. I don't know if you, you heard about that. Banks have to hold a, a ratio, respect a ratio between their own funds, okay, and the risk they are taking, okay. And uh, uh, in doing so, the idea is bright, but in doing so, it provides procyclical effect. Why? Because when you have, a, we are in a situation of risk, which is typically the case when you have a downturn in the cyclical uh, business cycle, okay, because then there are more firms in difficulty, you're not, you're not sure to your, your loan will be paid back, then you are going to push on the brakes, okay, because you are to respect this ratio, because the risks are increasing, and then you increase, in fact, the, the downturn cycle, because you, you stop, you put the brake in a moment where the cycle by itself is already going down. And on, on the other side of the cycle, when things are going well, when apparently everything is fine, risks are not so, so important, then you are going to, to, to take more risk, and you don't, you don't you underestimate at that time of the cycle the risks which are very important. I will come back to that in a moment. This is called the Minsky paradox. I will talk to that in a moment. Okay? Minsky showed, who is a post keynesian economist, showed that when everything is okay, this is when you take risk, and this is when authorities should be very careful, and the system created by Basel did not help you know, focusing the, uh, the attention of the authority on the, this excessive risk taken by the banks. Okay, the other topic which is today now settled, but which was not settled on the eve of the crisis, is the question of what we call macro prudential regulation versus what we call the systemic risk. In other words, in, on the financial system, you have two types of risk. You have uh, macroeconomic risk taken by, uh, led to, uh, linked to uh, individual actors, banks, investors. And this is dealt with what we call the micro prudential regulation. For instance, prudential ratios like the one I mentioned is a macro prudential regulation measure. Each individual bank has to respect the ratio. Hello, you, I hope you will find a place where to sit, I'm not sure. You may have to look for a, a chair. Here, there is a chair here. Oh, here is one, okay. And uh, in the beginning, the, come on, the Basel Committee did not deal with this uh, question of systemic risk. In other words, in a, in a system, you have not only macroeconomic risk, but you have also global <coughs> risk. Le due, due to many factors, the most important one is the connection, the interconnection between the different actors, okay? Uh, and also what, they, what Keynesian called the animal spirit or the herd effect. In other words, the influence that actors have to, on each other. And you, we need specific instruments, specific rules for that, which were not present in the, in the, in the system before the crisis. So I will show that some improvement has been made recently due to the crisis on this field. The question of liquidity. Uh, authority focused very much on the, what we call the unsolvability risk. The fact that one bank cannot pay back uh, uh, its, its loan on other banks, for instance. But we have another risk, which is a short-term risk, but which is very important, what we call liquidity risk. A bank at, 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 at some point of the ta at time, when the situation becomes critical may lose a lot of money. For instance, depositors are taking back their money and the bank has no more liquidity. It doesn't mean that the bank is not, is not solvent, but it cannot pay back on the short run other banks that, for instance, that it has to pay back. So this re liquidity risk was completely absent of the Basel system. So this was one of the major causes of the crisis also. I'll come back to that also. Now, 
my, my view, and I, I am among a minority of academics in saying that, for me, the capital requirements put forward by Basel Committee as a major measure, measure to stop or to prevent from risk-taking is having the adverse effects. Why? Most banks today are governed by shareholder logic. In other words, they are owned by shareholders who are providing capital to the bank, shares, okay, and are asking for high level of return. You may know that it is in the banking sector that the, what we call the return on equity ratio, return on capital, is the highest. If you look at the industry, car industry, chemical industry, and so on, you may have, let's say, return on equity ratio, let's say, around 7, 5, 7, 8. On the banking sector, it's around between 10 and 15 percent. Okay, much more. Why? I don't know why. It's very difficult to explain that. One of the reasons is that the pressure exerted by shareholders on this sector is very high, is much higher than on other sectors, on the, on the managers of banks. And the managers of banks are asked to yield around between 10 and 15 percent of return. You cannot yield such a high level of return without taking risk, important risk. And you know there is a close relationship between return and risk, okay? And by asking banks to have a high level of capital in their balance sheet amounts to force them to have a high level, to take high risk, to, to yield enough you know, return for the shareholders. So for me, there is a contradiction between the fact that saying banks need to have capital, high level of capital, which we can understand on a logical ground, but also asking the bank not to take too much risk, to be very careful about risk taking. So this is a point of view, but uh, I am in a minority saying that. Most economists, even, even, even Keynesian orthodox economists, heterodox economists would not agree necessarily with me, but I think, I, I think this is a very important argument. Yes? But there is capital that is a cushion in case of problem, and there's the capital that you uh, give in, in dividends to shareholders, and they're different, right? No. The capital you, which is used as caution is the one that belongs to the shareholders. And then you have to, to, to pay back your shareholders by dividends or to buy back actions or shares also to, to raise the, the level, the price of shares. But this capital, what we know capital basically is shareholders' capital. Okay? So this is a, this is a, a problem. And one of the consequences of my analysis is that we need other complementary prudential instruments beside capital requirement. I don't think, I don't say that capital requirements are not a good instrument, but we are pushing capital, the co Basel Committee is pushing too far the logic of the capital requirement. Okay? And in the Basel III, we'll come back to that in a moment, reform after the crisis, they still decided to high, to raise the level of capital requirement, and for me it's a problem. Yes? If I remember correctly, then the, the overall, overall effect of the Basel I and II and, and III is that even though there were um, like changes, um, overall the capital requirements decreased significantly since the early 80s. Decrease what? The, the capital requirements decreased no, no, since the 80s. No, if, the you, if you judge on, on, on total. I mean no, 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 no. The capital requirements in all reforms have been increased. Okay? But there is a specific point with Basel II is that big banks, large banks, were given the possibility to calculate by themselves, with their own internal model, to, ca to calculate, to evaluate the level of ca uh, capital they need, okay? In a very uh, sophisticated and sometimes very opaque, how do you say, non-transparent way. And we, we, we realized after the crisis, the subprime crisis, for instance, that a lot of banks in the US or in Europe were undercapitalized because, in fact, they, they cheated to, to some extent by using their own model to, to to come up to come up with an uh, insufficient level of capital requirements. So this is maybe what you have in mind. But the authorities, the authorities wanted to to raise the level of capital requirement. Yeah, well, I, it's exactly what you said. That um, I, I remember a study which showed that overall this regulation allowed lower capital. Okay, lower in, lower capital. to that so extent. If you, if you see this very okay, very simple um, correlation here, it does not look like um, that capital requirements really. Change the, the risk taking of 
Yes, I would agree. No, I would may even say more. It would, they, they push the system may, may push to some extent the bank to take more risk because they need to, to give I'm yield to capital. But I'm saying that lower capital requirements um, don't look like they help like no. against the risk no. taking. If you say higher capital requirements increase risk taking. Yes, because officially banks were asked to have more capital requirements. But on the other hand, they were allowed to evaluate themselves the level of capital they need. In fact, they, the large banks, which is not the case of small banks, by the way, large banks will have the, the money, the teams uh, to, to calculate this and to, to have this internal model, were able to, to make the, what we call the weighting, the ponderation of the risk in their own ways. And after the, the, after the crisis, we realized that the bank did not you know, have the respect the rule, really, because they were tended, they tended to underestimate the risk. They use models um, uh, very sophisticated, which are, in fact, were very difficult to understand for the authorities. But after the crisis, we realized that these models were not, were not good models. And they were, f they were based on very, criti very uh, how do you say, critical uh, assumptions, which were not very, uh, uh, which, are, which today, uh, would not be accepted because at that time the, the authority could not they, get, they give too much freedom to the banks in to, some, to some extent okay. yes i'm still confused because i see a difference between uh, reserve requirement and dividend payments whereas dividend payments are risky and um, reserve requirement are a cushion so they're safe okay uh, what do you mean by reserve requirement well this ratio that you say ba bank have to keep in order to be safe in with ratio account. with what with ratio with what? With what are the two terms of the ratio? Um, money lended with money in reserve. Okay, so this has something completely different. We have the reserve requirement, usually based on deposits, yep. okay, that bank has to hold to have a ratio between the deposit they collect and deposit is short-term money, which has nothing to do with capital, long-term capital, like capital here. So this is something which the central banks are using to regulate liquidity, but has nothing to do with the uh, with, uh, risk, risk or with the question of solvability in the long run. Okay, capital requirement is supposed to, to be on that side of long-term solvability requirement. Okay, do you, is it clear? So I was not, uh, under, uh, I had not the right ratio in mind. Yes. So what is the ratio you are talking about? So the ratio, the capital ratio, the Basel ratio is capital, long-term capital, shareholder capital, Okay, over risk, and the risk is calculated either by the authorities or by the internal model of the banks, which are sometimes underestimated the risk by their own, cal their own evaluations. Okay? But this, your question is, is interesting because w among the proposals we made uh, to complement the capital requirements, I propose with other economists a ratio, reserve uh, requirement ratio between um, um, the money bank should hold, but not deposit, in fact, but with respect, calculate, calculate with respect to credit, bank credit. In other words, if the ratio uh, is not respected, let's say it has to be 10%, it means that credit is going too fast, okay? And then if credit is going too fast, there is a good reason to think that maybe there may be a speculative behavior, for instance, on the real estate market, okay? And then the idea is to have a to push the bank, to force the bank to respect this ratio, that if they distribute a lot of loans, then they have to increase their liquidity, and then this is a way to, to reduce their, uh, their uh, let's say, their behavior, the speculative behavior. So this is one of the proposals we made, that beside capital requirements, which should not be used as a major instrument, should be complemented by other instruments, one, one of them could be the reserve requirement ratio, not on deposits, but on credits. Okay? Yes? No, no, uh, no, because I believe, like most uh, Keynesian economists, that uh, money is endogenous, money creation is endogenous. So it's not, it's just a way to put pressure on banks so that when the credit grows too fast, let's say much higher than the level of, P of GDP, for instance, it means that something wrong is going in the economy, and then this ratio will stop, or at least will discourage banks 
to go on and lending more and more. For instance, if you had this ratio I'm talking about on credit, in countries like the US, Great Britain, Spain, for instance, which have, or Ireland, who had huge real estate crisis linked to uh, speculative, uh, 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 disons, loans on the financial market to, to make money on the financial bubble, on the real estate bubble, we had, had we had this ratio, maybe this crisis wouldn't have been so, so important. It would have been a way to stop the bank to, re to reduce the, uh, the ability of banks to go on lending money on, on, the, on the real estate market while there was a bubble on this market. Okay, okay well, okay, go ahead. So to the doctrine of you know, higher um, you know, capital but reserve requirement ratios can be a spur for you know, development of some kind of shadow banking, yeah. you know, not relying on proper you know, refunding ones, uh, re refund wouldn't refund that refund by the central bank, mm -hmm. but will draw on money market funds in other, you know, shadow banking institutions to repos and that kind of things. No, um, what I'm talking about for the moment is only the traditional banking system. I'm not talk talking about the outside the regulated banking system, what we call the sometimes the shadow banking system. So here I'm talking about the only the 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 regulated banking system. Then I w w I'll come back to this question of banking, uh, shadow banking system afterwards, if you want. Okay. Now, uh, the problem also is that Basel Committee is a Basel is a committee for regulation of banks only, and not precisely on other non-banking institutions, which sometimes are very close to banks. Okay. Let's say, for instance, you may have um, hedge funds, which are borrowing money on banks, to banks, or to them on the market, on the money market, for instance, and who are making a lot of loans and taking very huge amount of risk, but are not regulated. They have no, re for instance, capital requirements. And this is a problem that uh, the idea is we, we need to broaden the perimeter the, the, of, of the uh, prudential regulation uh, of much, much uh, broad, in a broader you know, circle than the only the bank, the bank circle, okay? So this was a problem. Now, the rule of central banks, it is something very uh, interesting. There was, I don't know if you are aware of these different types of school. Just before the crisis, there was the most important school of thought in terms of central banking was called the new Keynesian, new Keynesian, not Keynesian, not post-Keynesian, new Keynesian view, not also no neo-Keynesian, you know, we have at least three. It's very misleading. What they call the new Keynesian view, which is a kind of mixture of neoclassical theory and, let's say, ISLM type of Keynesian theory. Okay? And uh, the idea of this, one of the major conclusions of this approach, is that monetary policy should focus on inflation targeting, targeting that the central bank should have an inflation target. Okay? And the major role of the bank, central banks, at, is to enforce this inflation target, okay? By uh, very simple ways, by two or three ways. One is just by is what we call the uh, talking on the market, being, having enough credibility to, to convince the market that this goal sh will be fulfilled, so then the market will conform. The other channel is uh, expectations. In other words, to be able to influence expectations of the actors, firms, households, and so on, that the rate of inflation, the future rate of inflation, will be, will be the one which is, which is uh, uh, set by the central bank. And so it's a very tricky and very specific way of saying that let, let, we are a central bank, we have a lot of credibility, we are independent, and if we say that next year inflation will be 5%, it will be 5%, okay? Influencing expectation, talking to the market, putting a level of interest rate on the money market to do the correct level and so on, okay? This was the, 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 doctri the, the doxa, the, the, the approach of uh, the logic of central bank before the, uh, the crisis, okay? And in that, in that um, domain, in this view, central bank, there was what they call the separation principle. In other words, central bank should deal only with monetary stability, basically stability of prices, and if there is a flexible exchange rate regime, eventually stability or at least control the level, more or less the control of exchange rate, which is external monetary stability, but should not deal with the question of banking and financial stability. Before the crisis, the idea of major central bankers was 
only such, uh, specific, specific authorities, like the, let's say, the FSA in, in Great Britain, which disappeared now, but uh, the Financial Service Authority, for instance, in Great Britain, okay, and such authority which were in charge of specifically finance and should deal with financial stability. Central banks do their own job is only dealing on monetary stability, okay? And we, we, we realized this, this was a very narrow view, but also a very misleading view. To some extent, this view led to the crisis under, uh, 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 if you use a uh, uh, Keynesian crisis, a Keynesian framework. You remember the expression of great moderation. The great moderation was a period of time at the end of the 90s until the crisis, about 15 years, where the, the world economy was behaving very well in the sense we had a high level of growth, not only in emerging countries, but also in so-called advanced economy, the US, Europe, uh, Japan. No, Japan was an exception because it was, the country was already in trouble. But the situation was fairly good. Not only high rate of growth, but also low rate of inflation. A lot of economists, new Keynesian view economists, saying we have found the rule, we have found the way of regulating the world economy. Look, we have a great moderation. The Minsky post-Keynesian view is completely different and the crisis showed that it was right. The idea is that when you have a situation of stability, apparent stability, where the expectations are very good in terms of growth, in terms of future returns and so on. This is when you are going to take risk, like what I was saying. And this risk taking will lead at a moment to another to a crisis. Another uh, idea put forward by another economist who is Claudio Borio, who is a post-Keynesian economist working at the BIS, Bank of International Settle Settlement, which is in, also in Basel. He called that the credibility paradox, which is not so far from the tranquility paradox. What is the idea? At the time of the great moderation, the credibility of central bank was very high. So most economic agents, firms, households, and so on, were very, very optimistic and very confident in the future. And this led them precisely to take risk. In other words, when you have the perception of a high credibility of central banks, this is when ac economic actors are going to take risk, okay? And if you take too much risk, at some point, you will pay for that because you won't be able to pay back your loans. You will have a lot of uh, uh, losses, for instance, and so on. And then this is when the crisis is coming. So this idea of Minsky tranquility paradox, Borio's credibility paradox, today, a lot of economists, Keynesian or not, think it's a good idea. I remember, for instance, Trichet, who was at the head of the central ECB at that time, okay, was writing or making declarations saying Minsky was right. I, I could not believe him. You know, when I read the, this, this declaration, I was really, very really, uh, surprised. But in fact, he realized that the problem is that the, the, the moment, what we call that the Minsky moment sometimes, the moment where we should be careful in looking at the risk-taking behavior is when it, the situation looks apparently very good, okay? Okay, so this is something which is very interesting, but I will, uh, it, the, the demonstration will go forward. I will the idea also, we made a survey in the late 90s about, uh, among central bankers, when I say we, uh, French economists, huh? uh, central bankers in the world and also economists, academic economists, professional economists working in banks and so on. And we asked them the following question. Did the great moderation led to an underestimation of risk? Okay, after this was asked after the crisis. Okay, I'm sorry, I said in the 90s we made this, this uh, survey after the crisis. Okay, just in 99 or something, 2009. 90%, 91% of ba central bankers and economists said yes, 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 yes. In fact, when we have a great moderation, when everything seems to be okay, maybe this is the time where well, you have a lot of risk taking. Myself, at that time, I was doing some empirical work on spreads. You know what is a spread? It's a gap, interest rate gap, between risky bonds, for instance, and non-risky bank, let's say bond, government bonds with respect to corporate bonds. I was all between countries, let's say, Greece versus Germany, okay, government bonds. At that time, if you look at the spreads, 
there was no spread between the Greek bonds and the German bonds. Almost no spread. The spread, as you know, is a measure of risk. No spread between government bonds and corporate bonds in, let's say, um, new technologies, where you have high level of risk sometimes. Which means that this is, a, this is a proof, this is a measure of the fact that there was an underestimation of risk in that time. Okay? So this is a very interesting thing to, to, to be aware of. And here is now our, demo our, our demonstration. In fact, uh, the idea is that we think that central bank has a too narrow conception of their mission, limiting to monetary stability. And in fact, the idea is that there is an ambivalent relationship between monetary stability and financial stability. On, in, in, on, in fact, when you have monetary stability, this does not need necessarily to financial stability. On the contrary, due to the Minsky paradox, because when you have monetary stability, you may have risks, a lot of risk taking. So the, the mistake made by central banks and a lot of people at that time is to think that during the Great Moderation, since there was monetary stability, since there was growth, there was no risk of financial instability. It's exactly the contrary which happened. Okay? So we said we, we have a very complex and um, going in both directions, you know, relationship between monetary stability and financial stability. And this is why we think that central bank we wrote, and that we wrote a paper that just after the crisis, a group of uh, French economists on that, on that topic saying, central bank, we should abandon the separation principle. Central bank should deal at the same time you know, with monetary stability and with financial stability because, because the two are linked and in a very complex manner, which needs to be taken into account by the central bank. Okay? So among the the other proposal about central banks, there was the idea that central bank has a major function, which is, as you know, the lender of last, last resort function, LLR. Okay? But the question is, what should be the scope of this LLR function? Should it be limited to the saving of banks, lending money to banks only? Or should the central bank go also on the financial markets? Okay? For, instance, for instance, lending money to the government by buying government bonds. Okay, this was a big, a big debate. Okay, this was a big debate, and the U.S. central bank, the Fed, was the first to say yes. Central bank has to go on the financial market to buy government bonds. Okay, whereas in Europe, uh, the ECB, with Mr. Trichet at that time, and then Mr. Draghi, didn't do that. They, stopped, they limited their uh, interventions to the banks and didn't go on the on the. Uh, on the um, government bond market. Why? Because this is due to the way the monetary zone is working. In the monetary zone, and in more broadly in the Europe, European Union, we have a, what we call a no bailout clause, which means that a government should not be helped, saved by another government. It's too warm. Yeah, why, don't we why don't we open these uh, yes. windows? Maybe we don't need to have the... Yeah. Let me do it. Maybe you can do that also this way, you know, the other window. Oh, we have a look, we have some, some fresh air coming. Okay. It's okay? Even if you cannot open the window, at least you can open the store. Well. Okay. Okay, ça va, ça va là Je t'ai pas bien remis Je t'ai pas bien remis Ah d'accord. Merci beaucoup. Merci. So, we, we, came, we came with the conclusion that central bank should lead, deal at the same time, contrary to the separation principle, should deal with monetary stability and financial stability. Hence, there is this bro broadening the, the, the scope of intervention of bank needs, of course, that we have to solve new problems which were not there before. One of them is target conflicts. What happens when you have 
an apparent conflict between going towards monetary stability, which would come in conflict with financial stability. At some point, it may, it may be the case. Then, you, the, 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 the answer given by theory, by economic theory in the 70s and 80s, that's by what it's called the theory of optimal policy mix. The idea is that when you have at least two, ex two targets, you need to have at least two independent instruments. It's like in a system of two equations, you need to have okay, two variables to solve, to sol to solve the, 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 the... If you have two unknown, two unknown variables, you need to have two equations to solve the problem. Okay, here, you have a system of two equations, one for financial stability, one for monetary stability. Hence, you need more than one instrument, two instruments. For instance, instruments devoted to financial monetary stability, like short-term interest rate, but also you need to have prudential regulation instrument and, you know, may, uh, used by the central bank to, s to try to solve the problem of financial stability. And when you have a conflict, you have to make a hierarchy in the instruments, in the targets sometimes. You say, okay, I'm going to fight first the question of financial stability because it, it may have more damage on the economy than monetary instability. But to, to solve that kind of question, you need to have one agent and not three or four different agents solving the problem. This is why we think that central banks should be the one. But central banks, this raises a democratic issue. Because since central bank is gaining more power, more responsibility, it has to be more accountable. And hence, what we propose in broadening the role of central bank is inconsistent with the, with the pure independence of central bank. We do think that what the central bank broadens their role, as we, we shall see, and it's due to the crisis, okay? But then we did not change the status or the, the rules, you know, of governance of the central bank because today they remain basically completely independent. And you cannot have in a democratic society an independent body which has such a, such a, a, great, a great amount of power. So for us, there is a progress in, as we shall see, in solving the target of conflict, in solving the in, in, uh, it's saying that, okay, central banks should deal with monetary and financial stability, but then the question, what about accountability of central banks, okay? This is the type of question we are raising. Of course, I'm going very fast. It's a very complicated matter, but it's, it's just, just to give you a flavor of the type of problem we may have when we deal with financial regulation in connection with the role of central banks. Yes? Has there been a study on the effects of multiple agencies trying to work towards their own goal and how they interact? Yeah. Maybe prevent the proper functioning of each other? Yes, yes. Yeah, but the problem is what coordination? Yeah, like in case they don't coordinate, I'm just interested if there has been... Okay, again, yes, I can give you a very good example. In Great Britain, just before the crisis, we have the Bank of England on one side, Central Bank in Great Britain, and on the other side, the FSA I mentioned before, Financial Service Authorities, which was a very powerful agency in charge of financial stability, dealing not only with banks, but also with insurance and also with the regulation of financial markets. They, they did not work together. They did not share information together, okay? The central bank has a lot of information because it borrow money, it lend money to banks. It, it knows wh what are the banks which are in trouble. The FSA did not have this information and it, and it, make, it made a lot of mistakes, or mistakes and it was not very efficient, at least at the beginning of the crisis, to solve the crisis in Great Britain, to help solving the crisis. And now they, they abandoned this idea. In fact, the, the idea was abandoned and uh, he, now there is a, a, a the, the, great, the, the great Bank of England is very, is, is taking, has taken back a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of responsibilities in terms of financial regulation due to that because there was too much separation no coordination. But even if there is a minimum of coordination, uh, you may have problem because you need at least a good amount of coordination. In France, we had a specific system, which not necessarily is the best one, but was better than the British one. The agency in charge of financial regulation uh, is in fact uh, connected to the central bank, the, the Banque de France. In other words, uh, it, it, uh, it is people from the Banque de France who are working in this agency, okay? And they have a good, they communicate very well, the two agencies. Although Central Bank, the Banque de France saying that this agency is supposed to be independent, to my, to my view, it's not independent. It has some autonomy, but not independence. This is a solution given by the French, the French authority. Each country is different. 
If you go in Japan, if you go in the UK, if you go in the US, you will have different solutions because the institutions are different. Okay? But the worst case, the worst situation was the British one just outside, at the outset of the, of, the, uh, of the crisis. And Gordon Brown who was the, the one who decided to have these two institutions, Bank of England, uh, uh, the FHA separated, was a go very good uh, Minister of Finance, by the way, was not the worst one we, the British had. And then was Prime Minister when the crisis came. He, he had a political problem because since he was the one responsible for this system of separation, uh, he was very much criticized by uh, his uh, political adversary. And this is one of the reasons why he had to get, to get out of office. No, it was not the only way, reason why. But uh, this is a, it's a, it's a highly political issue, in fact. How do we organize the power, the respective relative power of the different agency in a country in charge of stability, monetary and financial stability. There is at least one thing now, now with which most economists would agree is that we need to have the central bank to have a minimum responsibility on the question of financial stability. The principle of separation, which was put forward, by the way, by Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz. I don't know if you, you know Milton Friedman. And Anna Schwartz, they wrote a very important book in the 60s on the monetary history of the US. And they came with this uh, view, which is completely wrong, in fact, uh, as we know today, but there should be a separation between central bank and uh, authority in charge of, uh, of uh, financial stability. This, is, this was their view, and this view, <laughs> nowadays, this view is completely uh, abandoned. OK, okay let me go, yes? Because um, it's w already one hour. OK, we can be there at 6 o'clock tonight. It's not a problem for me. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's about just the optimal policy mix, uh, mm -hmm. like with fiscal policies. But then I was just wondering about uh, the uh, European Union. Yes. Of course, like it's uh, more complicated than in the other country. Yeah. And so I was wondering what you were advocating for in the short run. Because I mean, we could uh, think about the fiscal union in the long run. But um, in the short run, how can, could we have at least a kind of optimal policy mix in the European Union. Okay. The, this theory was put forward by economists a long time ago in the 60s, 70s, one of them being Tinbergen. Uh, Tinbergen was the first Nobel Prize in economy or something like that, you see, so it's a long time ago. He's a bright, bright, bright person. I, I, he wrote very, he's, he was also an econometrician. Uh, and in fact, when Tim Bergen and all the f his followers worked on optimal policy mix, they were talking about the optimal combination of monetary policy and fiscal policy, viewed as the two, uh, in, the, in the Keynesian framework, huh, viewed as the two major instruments you can use to stabilize an economy at the macroeconomic level. Okay? And what they were saying, they were saying we need these two instruments. They don't have exactly the same features and the same what do you say, qualities. Huh? But they, are, they should be used, but they should be used in a very coordinated way. Okay? They should not be independent. In other words, we should say at one point, if we are, let's say, inflation, what is, what is the best, best instrument? What is, would be the most powerful one? So if we decide that inflation is the most important target, and if we decide that monetary policy may be the most efficient instrument, then we give to monetary policy a priority on fiscal policy. And we will combine the two to respect this hierarchy of targets and instruments. This is what he was saying. Now, if we come at the European level, we completely abandon this view. I would say, unfortunately, because we have on one side a very integrated monetary policy with the uh, European Monetary Union, with the ECB, okay? We have only one interest rate, we have only one goal in terms of inflation for the whole Union. Whereas you have some country where you have no inflation, like Germany, for instance, and countries in southern Europe where you have inflation. But yes, we have only one target, which is completely, by the way, ridiculous. But that's the way it is. And you have one monetary policy, but you have, okay, 17, because you have 17 members in Eurozone now, 70 different fiscal policies, okay, which is ridiculous, okay? This cannot work. This cannot work. It cannot be articulated. So this is why we abandon the idea in, in, the, in Europe of articulating monetary and fiscal policy. So I am among the economists who are saying, since we have uh, integrated monetary policy, we need to have an integrated fiscal policy. We need to have common targets, uh, 
with respect to uh, fiscal policy in terms of budget deficit. So this is already the case to some extent. We all need also to have, with respect to taxation, so we have to harmonize taxation. This is absolutely not the case, okay? And so on. So, we, and one of the reasons why the Eurozone may, may go bankrupt, may, may implode in the future, is because we don't have this idea of optimal policy mix present in the, in the way the European system is working. We have only integrated monetary policy, integrated monetary instruments, and so on, and absolutely no integrated fiscal policy. We, on the contrary, we have fiscal competition. We have countries with a very low level of, <laughs> of taxation, like Ireland, for instance, if you look at the taxation on business, and countries like France with a higher, much higher level of business taxation, and so on. This cannot work. So we have to decide. And since we have decided that the subsidiary principle, subsidiarity principle, that is the, the decentralization, maximum decentralization should be applied to fiscal issues, we cannot have this integrated policy. And in, and in Europe, there is a very dangerous rule, which is a rule of unanimity for respect to the fiscal issues. So you cannot change fiscal, take a fiscal decision with respect, for instance, to a, a taxation like a, a added value tax without having the unanimity of all countries. This is impossible. Okay, so this is a big, a big problem. And one way to, to, to get around this difficulty has been the, what we call the reinforced cooperation principle. I don't know if you know that. In the treaty, Lisbon Treaty, there is this possibility of having nine countries representing at, most, at least 60% of the population of the Union going together forward on a, a given issue, taxation, but it can be anything else. It can be the rule with respect to, uh, I don't know, uh, climate and so on. And countries go together, even if there is no all countries. And if they, if they reach an agreement, then they propose the agreement to the rest of the countries. We are not obliged to accept it. And the F FTT directive, which has been negotiated and which has, we had a result just before uh, the election of Macron in France, we had an agreement with the idea of having a FTT with 10 countries, among which there was Germany, France, Italy, Spain. So the largest country were there, okay, in terms of population. And Macron decided to stop that, okay, because Macron, as you know, is very close to the banking system, the financial system, who is very much against this type of instrument, because they think, and not, they are not wrong, they think they will lose money, they will not make as much money on speculation, for instance, if there is that kind of instrument. Okay, so to, to, I'm just, I, I saw your hand. Uh, so I would say to answer your question, in Europe, we have no optimal policy mix with respect to monetary and fiscal policy, but you can apply this principle also to the articulation, this is what I, I was doing, between monetary and, and monetary and financial policy. And this has been done to some extent after the, the crisis. Yes? Uh, yeah, but, uh, such policy mix, if you integrate it European-wise, it makes some sense in terms of like financial stability, maybe in terms of uh, some capital flux, which is linked also to the financial stability. But I, I don't really understand how it is possible to have economic activity and, I don't know, maybe even growth in, in the real economy in, with the same fiscal policies in countries that have industrial landscapes that are so different as like, for instance, I don't know, Greece, Germany, England, and France. And Good question. You have to ask yourself, what is, well, how do you define fiscal policy? If you take the Musgrave, very old vision, monetary policy is here to finance public goods, to make stabilization, macroeconomic stabilization, and to make redistribution, three function of resources in a country or in a region. Yeah, no. Also. Yeah, what? Of investment, yeah, investment if you want, okay. Ask this one if you want. When I say in public good, I was thinking of public investment in public good, but okay. Now, if you accept this definition of what is uh, fiscal policy or public policy, broadly speaking, if you apply this to Europe, then the objection you, you just mentioned is not, does, not, does, not, does not work because let's take the case of Greece, Greece and Germany. Germany is a very rich surplus country Okay, which means that it has a high level of domestic saving. Greece has a high, the poor country compared to Germany, with a huge deficit. So no, no, no saving. On the contrary, it's borrowing 
every month more money from abroad. One way to solve the problem in a Musgrave or in a optimal policy view framework is to say let's let's look at Europe as a whole country, as a whole country, okay, and to make transfers on public public funds but also private funds to make transfers from the country where you need investment coming from the country which has a high level of saving. This is a very easy to understand. And this is exactly what the contrary which is taking place. The con which if you look at the flows going from Greece to Germany, you can see that the money saver, uh, taxpayers in, in, in Greece are paying now is, is used, has been used mainly to pay back the German banks, or the French bank, by the way, to pay back their, their, their debt. In other words, you have something which is completely against the, the good, I uh, would say, macroeconomic logic, which would mean that money should flow towards a country which needs investment, which has a, not enough saving. It, it's exactly the country which is contrary which is going on in Europe. This is why the inequality within Europe are growing. B between Greece and between uh, Germany, for instance, to take these two extreme example countries, you have growing inequality. How, how this system can last? It cannot, it cannot last in, uh, indefinitely in the future. So if we are going on this type of uh, regime, you can be sure that one day or the other, this system will, go will, will break, okay? And if it will not break for economic reasons, it will break for political reasons. Because what you see in Europe now, you can see the results of elections all over Europe, okay? More and more you have populist, nationalist government with saying, stop, we don't want to play the, the rule of the game because they are against us, or they think they are against them. And this is what will happen probably in the 10 coming years. We will have political crisis and the breakdown of the European Union. This is a, a most likely scenario. I hope it won't happen, of course, but this is what will happen if we are going on this view, if we don't have that kind of optimal policy mix. Okay, so I don't know if this answers your question, but I'm going very far away from my topic. So, bank reserve, I will go faster now. To the, the, this question of bank failure, just recall one or two b basic ideas. Banks are not economic institutions that the, the other. In other words, banks have a different way of functioning, different rules, and they are more risky than regular business. Okay? One of the reasons why they are risky, there are two, at least two, two features of the banking system. One, that the, the role of banks, the business, is to take risk and to also ensure the risk of their own customers. So they are the risk takers to some extent. Okay? Banks are risk takers. Okay, and this is uh, uh, one, one thing which is admitted by most economists, okay? The other specificity of the banking system, of the banks, is that they, they form a system. You talk about the banking system, you don't talk about the, the car industry system. You, car, you talk about the car industry sector. So the banking sector is more than a sector, it is a system. It has a systemic dimension. Why? Because banks are tightly interconnected. In, if, if one bank, in particular if it is a, a large bank, gets into trouble due to the important interconnection it has with other banks, it creates problems very quickly to other banks, what we call the domino effect. Okay? And this is a specificity of the banking system. Why? This is why we have to be very careful with this question of bank, what we call bank failure and resolution. The term of resolution means the way you solve the question of bank failures. Now you have two major principles. One is to bail out, the other one is to bail in. If you bail out, you have a moral hazard problem. If the managers of banks know that even if they take too much risk, they have to be saved, they have to be helped in case of problems by public money, by government money, they will take more risk. They are not pushed to improve their management. This is the moral hazard. On the contrary, if they know that in case they get into trouble, they will, the shareholders will have to pay, then they will lose their job. Of, they will lose their job right away because the shareholders will be very unhappy to see that the manager has lost money and that they, are, they, they won't get dividends in the future and so on and so on. So the idea is that during the, after the, the subprime crisis, most governments want to help the banks in the US, in Great Britain, 
in France, and so on. Now we have, we have to decide that this system is not optimal because of the moral hazard problem, the problem of too big to fail. We call that also sometimes too big to jail for the bank <laughs> managers. Well, OK, um, you heard of that. So the idea is that we have to find a new way of regulating the bank failure. We, there are different procedures. One of them is what we call the living wheels. The living wheel is, 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 is the following idea. Banks and bank managers have to say in advance, before there is a problem, what they will do in case of problem. What assets they are going to sell, how they will change their governance, and so on. So that if there is a problem, then they know right away what they should do under the supervision of the authority. Okay? So this may help solving problems in case of, pro of difficulties. And taxation of bank. We talk about the FTT, financial transaction tax. In fact, after the crisis, the IMF was asked to propose taxation of banks okay, to uh, found a, a, an international fund which would get that money coming from the banks and to provide money to the banks in case they are in trouble so that taxpayer wouldn't have to pay. It would be this fund, okay, this, which would be an international fund. So this was a proposal, I remember, because Mr. Strauss-Kahn was at the head of the IMF at that time, who wrote a report on that, very interesting report. And most countries, at least largest countries in the G G20, uh, were against it. The US was against it. UK was against it. Uh, Canada was against it. I think it was in, some it was in Toronto. So Canada was against it, and so on. So they did not go on. But one idea would have been to do that is to do let banks have to pay because they take more they take sometimes too much risk. It shouldn't be taxpayers, okay? And we have to make money on a special special fund, international fund, and to pay in case of problems. So that's, that's, that was a proposal. Now, the other proposal is to say that shareholders and creditors, at least long-term creditors, should pay for the bank, so the bank deficits, the bank, uh, uh, in, instead of taxpayers. So how do we organize that? We, have, we should have new rules saying that in case bank is making, is making losing money, this bank, this, this money should be paid by first shareholders, then long-term creditors, and not certainly not taxpayers. This rule has, oh, none of these rules has been implemented. We have some living rules, wheels in some countries, but this is very uh, not so important. No taxation of banks and no, uh, sp no constraining rule in terms of having uh, shareholders and creditors pay instead of uh, uh, taxpayers in case of problems. Yes? So what's the difference then to the bail on regulation that's currently existing in the EU? Because there has been the takeover of the Spanish bank by another Spanish bank, which was held the first bail on the European level. Mm -hmm. um, was it, what is, is it lacking then the shoulder shareholder and creditors? Well, in Europe, the, I will come to that in a moment. We have a banking union, and we'll, so I will answer to that question after, okay, if you accept. Okay, now, there is another debate which is very interesting because in different countries you have different types of syst banking system. Let's stay in Europe, or let's, let's put together US and Germany on one side, France and Germany on the other side. In the US and Germany, you have a lot of banks, a lot of small banks. If you take Germany, for instance, you have a lot of small and medium-sized banks, which are cooperative banks, private banks with shareholders, public banks, okay, and only two big large banks, which are the Deutsche Bank and the Commerce Bank. In, 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 in the US, it is the case to a large extent. US, you have a lot of small local banks, regional banks, and a few very large banks, of course, like Goldman Sachs and so on. But you have a system which is diversified, in which small and medium-sized banks are more important for the financing of the economy, of the real economy, than the large banks. In France, and in France it's, it's quite different. If you look at France, you have huge banks. Four of them are making 80% of the banking activities, okay? and small banks do not count particularly. So you can see that regulation should be quite different in the case of France or in the case of Germany or in the US. And this is why the European countries do not agree on the type of regulation we need because 
France and Germany, for instance, which are, let's say, have a very important role in, the, in Europe, as you know, do not agree because they don't have the same type of banking system. The Mrs. Merkel does not want to put regulations which are too constraining on banks, in particular on small banks. Whereas uh, the French authorities and, and Merkel wants to make strong regulation on large banks because, as you may know, the Bundesbank, the, the, the Deutsche Bank is in big trouble now. Okay? And Mrs. Merkel is very much in favor of putting a lot of pressure on this bank. In France, it's quite the contrary. You have a huge bank like BNP Paribas, Société Générale, Crédit Agricole, and so on, who are making, who are dominating the system. And not only that, you have a lot of collusion between the elites. In other words, 90% of the managers, the high managers of French banks, come from the Ministry of Finance. Okay? Macron is a very good example. Macron was first a uh, at Bercy, what we call Bercy, that is the Ministry of Finance, then he came to a bank, then he came back to the Elysee, as a, working with François Hollande, and then he was Ministry of Finance, and now he's President of the Republic. This is a very good example of the way the French system is working. There is a strong collusion linked between the elite on the government side and the elite on the banking side. And this is why the, it is extremely difficult to make a, strong regulation against or on big banks in France because the elite are so strong, for instance, that they cannot, they cannot force them to make, the re, to make the revision. This is why Mr. Macron, for instance, is against the, the strong, he, he thinks that the regulation, the current regulation on bank is too strong, too constraining, okay? So this is the view we have, and in Germany, it's the contrary. He would say we have to make more regulation on large banks. So one of the big problems we have in Europe is the difference between the country, which are uh, huge in many terms, but in particular with respect to the banking sector. And this is why we are going, we are trouble. We, can't, we cannot find a real agreement on, on this, uh, this field. Now, I have to go to, to be a bit faster now. I will talk to you to three things, about three things. Uh, maybe I should I will go with fast with the bank, Dodd Frank Act, who, as you know, is almost dead thanks to Mr. Trump, but I will talk to it about, about it a few minutes, the Basel III reform and the European Banking Union dealing precisely with the question you mentioned. No, <coughs> the authorities had, in Basel, they realized that the system does not work, was not efficient in preventing the financial <coughs> crisis, and even probably contributed to the financial crisis, as I explained uh, a few minutes ago. Now, so we have an interesting reform, which is a progress to some respect, because the new Basel III reform deals with the procyclicity question. Okay, so they, they created what they call a contracyclical buffer in the ratio, re capital requirement ratio. They introduced a liquidity ratio, which was not present. So they deal with the liquidity risk problem. And also they, uh, uh, they introduced a few more, uh, uh, a few more um, progress. The one, one of them is being, please, saying that the systemic risk is something very important, which was not recognized before. Hence, we need to uh, deal with this question. And for instance, in Europe, it was decided that the ECB, European Central Bank, is going to coordinate a group with professional academics and managers of bank, which are in charge of uh, kind of observatory of the risk systemic risk, in other words, to detect if there is at some moment, at some point of the banking system, a problem of systemic risk. Because systemic risk is a very, uh, it, takes, it can take many different forms. You cannot give a, a definition, a simple definition. So you have to have people who are very good experts, who are able to see that at some point, two banks, which are, for instance, highly connected, are in trouble. And if they get into trouble, more trouble, they, this may create more problem to the whole banking system. This is the type of thing they are working on. By the way, I didn't mention that. It was also decided to make what they call stress test. I don't know if you heard about that. Stress test is to simulate shocks on banks to say, for instance, if there is uh, uh, one bank in trouble or if there is a jump I interest rates in the future, let's say uh, two points or two percent point in, in one year. What will happen on the bank? Which bank will go resist? 
which bank will not resist to such shock shocks. We call that stress test. So this is a type of uh, improvement we have to detect the bank which are which which are weak, which are pro we may have problem in the future. So this was a, this was a progress. But for me, uh, we have still do two two major problems. One is that we still give too much weight to capital adequacy ratio for the reason I mentioned to you. For me, this is not the solution. We, we need other instruments, and it was not decided to, uh, to do so. And also the famous problem of shadow banks. In other words, the problem, I don't know if you heard of this uh, concept, what we call the um, uh, analytical dialect dialectic. Oh, no, the, let me see, regulation dialectic, which is the following. Each time there is a problem in the banking system, the authority are going to change regulation. Each time there is a change in regulation, you will have an endogenous financial innovation, the whole of which is to circumvent the regulation. Okay? So you have a, a kind of game like the, like the cat and the, the mouse, you know, each, you know, the mouse uh, going further but running faster that's this other banks and the cat, and the cat trying to catch the mouse. The, the, the mouse. The idea is the following. I can give you one example or two examples. For instance, the securitization system can be viewed. So I, I, I suppose you know what is securitization of loans. Securitization is a major innovation which can be interpreted as a reaction of banks to circumvene bank regulation was which was put forward you know in the 80s and 90s for instance capital capital ratios if the risk for instance of lending to consumers household on the real estate market is deemed very high then banks have to have on funds very high level of on funds on funds are very capital funds are very high very costly because you have to, to give yields to shareholders, high yields to shareholders. So one way to get around, you distribute loans, but then you sell the loans very quickly by securitizing, securitizing them to investors, and you get out, you get rid of the, of the loans. So you earn commissions, you make money in distributing loans, but you don't get, get the loan on conserve or keep the loans in your own balance sheet, which was the role of traditional banking in the, in the, in the past. Okay? So for me, one way of interpreting the, the huge development of securitization in the US, but also in, Euro, in Europe and so on, is it's an innovation deemed to that. Another example, which I will not develop, I wrote uh, several papers on this issue also, is that the, the euro dollar market, which was created in the 60s, so a long time ago, can be viewed as a way of U.S. banks to circumvent the regulation of, uh, in particular, the Q, the Q ratio regulation, which would limit the, the money you could give to depositors, in particular to foreign depositors in, in, in the U.S. banks. So the U.S. banks said, OK, we are going to London. In London, they accepted the loans, the deposits, I'm sorry, the deposit, and they did not pay any tax. So they were very happy and they could do what they want. So the euro dollar market can be viewed, which is a major innovation, financial innovation at the international level, which played a very important role in the particular in the instability of uh, the monetary system in the 70s, uh, can be viewed also as a result of financial innovation meant to circumvent, to avoid uh, a, a regulation, okay? So the big problem, let me finish. The big problem we have now is that each time the authorities are going to put forward new regulations, you can be sure that there will be new products, new process, and one of them today, one of major, can, can takes the name of shadow banking system. The shadow banking system, which has been developed a lot in many countries, not only in the US, in Great Britain, in France, in, in, Europe, in Germany, but also in China, as you may know. This system is a system of operation outside regulated system, okay? So one way to circumvent, to avoid official regulation, in particular prudential regulation, is to make your operation outside the regulated system. And this is what is called the shadow banking system. And today, one of the major threats 
to the stability of the not only the European but the world financial system is this question of the shadow banking system, which is a system which is not regulated at all or very weakly regulated, and which may be the center of the next crisis. Okay, so this is a problem. Yes. So which institutions do you include in the shadow banking system? Uh, okay, so you have many. It's a huge variety of, of uh, institutions. The most famous, I mentioned already before, is the hedge funds. But you would find all type of what they call in, in official statistics, in official documents, non-banking financial institution. Non-banking. So you may have a lot of investors. You may have also a lot of uh, what we call financial uh, vehicles. Okay. We may be in the off balance sheet of banks, okay, but we, since they are in the off balance sheets, are not regulated in the same way as operation which is in the balance sheet, and hence which can avoid a lot of prudential regulation. Okay, so you have a lot of different institutions and instruments uh, which can be used. For instance, the derivative market, a lot of operation on the derivative markets can be can be seen as being implemented in the shadow banking system. In like a broader definition of the shadow banking system, also insurance companies and other types of funds are included. But am I wrong that there, there are regulations for these kinds of... Yes, yeah, but weaker regulation. So take, take, take the case of speculative hedge funds. You have a directive in Europe on the regulation of hedge funds. If you look at the regulation of hedge funds, it's a very weak regulation compared to regulation regard, regarding the banks. Because it is con two things are considered. One is that it is, uh, uh, they are not as important in terms of risk. I think it's a wrong assessment. But that, and second, it is considered that there is a, a bail-in type of system. In other words, if a speculative fund is losing money, is, making bank is, is going, going bankrupt, the shareholders will lose, the creditors will lose, but not the taxpayers. This is why the most, in most countries, and Europe in particular, in the EU, uh, hedge funds are not regulated. Okay? But you may have also uh, uh, money for type of money market funds, for instance, which are going to collect a lot of money outside the banking system and which are going then to lend that money to other firms or to other financial institutions. And we are taking also a, lo a lot of risk. What is we are not guaranteed by some strong, some kind of, of regulation. So, so we, alors, our, there is different definition of the shadow banking system. Myself, with a colleague, we wrote a couple of papers on that. We, we think that, at least regarding the French system and the European system, the best definition is to, to look not at institutions, but operations. In other words, it, it seems to us that uh, when you look at the French big banks, which are con huge conglomerates, universal banks, as they call them, a lot of operations made by these banks, in fact, are made in direction of the, the shadow banking system. But, uh, for instance, they, they lend a lot of money to hedge funds or to investors, okay, short-term investors and so on. So, in France, since we have universal banks, we are very active not only in traditional banking, but also in financial market, on derivative market and so on. Our bank, French banks, in fact, are very present in the shadow banking system, which is within the banks. Whereas you have other definitions, which are not, to my, to my view, are not good, saying that the shadow banking is something which is completely separated from the traditional banking system. So you have on one side banks, okay, and on the other side shadow banks. But this view is wrong because, in fact, in many cases, in France in particular, and Europe, you have a lot of connections between the two. And this is why it is dangerous, because even if banks are correctly regulated, let's say, suppose that by the prudential regulation, they may get into trouble because they have operation with non-weakly regulated institutions who are making very dangerous operations, okay? highly risk, risk, risk operation. And if it's so, this may get them put, put them in trouble in the future. Okay? And of course, this is a, why I, I recall I, in, a, in my, uh, one of my, uh, I, I mentioned the fact that the Basel Committee didn't go very far. Uh, well, what is it? Well, anyway. Yeah, the supervision, we, you know, uh, is focused on banks only. 
when I was saying that, I was mentioning the fact that it should be focused on other actors than banks, hedge funds, for instance, or other types of actors, and also operations, because no, it should not think in terms of institution, but also in terms of operations. Some of them should be forbidden, for instance, or some of them should be strictly limited. Okay. But this is not what the philosophy of the, uh, of the commi Basel Committee. Yes? Um, you mentioned securitization, and as I understand it, like in the Minsky framework, in money manager capitalism, the securitization was the deciding financial innovation that led to the collapse. But would you say that the regulation... I didn't say that. I said it led to the, dev the huge development of securitization. So you can say that securitization is a cause of the collapse. I would not be in disagreement with that. But what I said is only, if you look at the, there is a, a dyadic, dyadical link, connection between regulation and financial innovation. And a good number of important financial innovation, euro dollar market, securitization, shadow banking, can be viewed as a way, as an innovation, which is, it's, it's, these are quite different innovations. But these are innovation whose rationale is to escape from official banking regulation. Okay. But if you would assume that it was already part of the financial crisis, then would you say the regulation on it was sufficient since then? The regulation was on like on securitization itself was sufficient. No, it was not sufficient. Of course, this is why we had too much. But even now, the okay. European Commission. Is, uh, go is made a very, very weak type of regulation on uh, securitization, saying there are two types of regulation, good, transparent regulation, and the bad. And uh, well, this is completely ridiculous, because you cannot say w what is good, what is bad. It's very difficult. And th the only small progress is the following, to fight against moral hazard. Banks should hold in the balance sheet at least 5% of the assets they have in case of securitization. For instance, if you have 100 of loans to household, you can securitize 95%, but you should keep in your balance sheet 5% of the risk. Okay? This is viewed as a way to push the bank to be more careful when they distribute loans, knowing that they are going to sell the loan in the future by securitizing them. So I think it's a good idea, but 5% is not enough. I would say at least 10 or 15 percent. Then it would have some impact. But 5 percent is a too weak a ratio. But the, the idea is not completely wrong. OK? <coughs> yes? Um, about the regulation uh, on the shadow banking, uh, and, or like the small regulation, yeah. is, it, uh, is there like a technical problem? Is it technically difficult to, to regulate the shadow banking system? Or is it more than anything else, like a political issue? they manage not to be regulated? Well, I'm sorry to say both. By the way, one of the two papers uh, Mr. Lavois sent you before the lecture, maybe you had uh, some time to look at it, you may look at it afterwards, is one of the called Monitor the Shadow Banking System. So it's an analysis, well, interesting analysis about the way the ba shadow banking system could be or should be regulated. So now, it's, you, you may say it's a technical issue because the authorities did not decide to break up the opacity of the system. So in other words, being too laxist, not very much uh, constraining on the financial agents, they don't have all the information they need to, to, supervise, the agent, to supervise this system. So at, at the beginning, it, it's a technical and political problem. The political problem is that there is no the political will to, s to have more information and to, to be more constraining on banks and uh, all, all the actors which are in the banking system, in the shadow banking system. And then, technically speaking, once you, you see what kind of operations are involved, what kind of actors are involved, I think it's not so, so difficult. By the way, the China's authorities, because uh, it's very interesting to compare what's being done in Europe, for instance, and being done in China. In China, well, I, I, don't, I don't know if you heard this, uh, this idea. In the regulationist school, we think that there are different types of capitalism, what we call the diversity or variety of capitalism. In China, you would have what, the, what we call sometimes state capitalism. 
In other words, a capitalism which is strongly governed by the state. It is capitalism, but the state is extremely powerful. In the US and in Great Britain, you would have a market or financial market capitalism. In other words, the role of the regulation of some financial market is very important. The pressure put on financial actors to have a low level of regulation, the existence of the city also, which is, which is based on a, which is a place where you have a low level of regulation, low level of taxation, okay? All this makes this system, the British system, quite different from the Chinese system. In France, in Germany, we are in between, although we are quite different, France and Germany, as I mentioned. So in France, we have the role of the state is fairly important, but more and more, the state is playing the game of the financial actors, okay? Whereas in Germany, you have a different capitalism. You have an industrial capitalism. In Germany, industry is more important than finance. Okay? For most political leaders, for most people in the country, in Germany, what is important is the industry. And you have to, to, to be very constraining to, regu to regu regulate tightly the financial sector because it, it is viewed very often as a danger for the stability and the efficiency of the industry, okay? So you can see that in this uh, different country, you may have, you will have different types of, different types of, uh, uh, of policy. The political will to regulate uh, uh, the shadow banking system in China and in Germany for different reasons uh, uh, may be stronger than in France or in, in the US or in Great Britain, okay? So it is, m m I cannot give an answer, general answer to your question because it's, uh, it depends on uh, each country uh, and the, the, final, the type of financial system we have. Okay? In Europe, we have a continental Europe, you have a, we have a bank-based financial system, although our banks in France, for instance, are financial in institutions as well as bank, banking institutions, but let's say we have a bank-based bank financial system. In the UK, in, in, in the US, you have a, a financial market-based institution, uh, financial market. So you have different systems, and this creates different uh, decisions. This leads to different decisions by authorities to regulate the system. And so also the role of the lobbies are not the same. They don't push in the same directions in the different countries. OK? <coughs> Is it OK? So this I will go very fast. Mr. The Obama administration in 2010 decided to have an act, a very ambitious act, uh, uh, about financial regulation and banking regulation. Here are the major, I will go in detail, uh, the, the, different, uh, the different rules, okay? So it, it was dealing with, with banks, okay? Uh, I don't know if you heard of the Volcker rules about the way, the limits on the way, the, on the actions, operations that banks could have using their own funds, no speculation on own funds, what they call the proprietary trading, limits on financial participation in hedge funds, which is a way to limit the role of shadow banking, by the way, because hedge funds are part of shadow banking, okay? So this is, I, I won't go into detail, you will look at that. Wha one of the reasons I, go, I won't go into detail is that like Mr. Trump has decided to break down the Dodd-Frank Act. So we don't know yet what will become with this act, okay? Because Mr. Trump uh, thinks that Wall Street is very important. They are very close to him politically. And he doesn't want, he thinks that this regulation is too constraining. So how far will he go in dismantling the Dodd-Frank Act? We don't know. It's a, very, it's a big mess now because, as you know, when you vote a, a, a law, then you have to have a lot of uh, what we call in France the décret d'application. You know, the rules should be defined, applied in a very precise and definitive way. It takes many years. And uh, the Dodd-Frank Act was not completely applied already. It, it's, a long, it's a long work. So now that Mr. Trump has said, I'm going to get rid of that, we don't know which rules we go, will be abandoned, which rules will be kept. So it's very difficult to know. I'll come back to that in a moment. So now, in Europe, we had, we, we had a, a, a major reform uh, which is called the Banking Union in 2012. 
The banking union is interesting. I will go fairly fast huh, because you can read a lot of papers. It's very easy to find information about that. But remember that we have three pillars, two major pillars in this new organization of the banking system. One is that the ECB, the European Central Bank, is becoming now the single supervisor of large banks. No more separation. No more separation between financial and monetary stability. In other words, the idea is that big banks, okay, and f all French banks are in this case, for instance, are going to be under the direct supervision of the central bank. Okay. This is something completely different. This is a, a good progress, albeit the problem of democracy I mentioned to you regarding the, 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 the role of the central bank. Now, we have also a new second pillar, which is a to the creation of a wide European common insurance deposit system. So the idea is that now all depositors in the European Union will have the guarantee of benefiting in case of the bank, if the bank go bankrupt, be benefiting to uh, 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 an insurance with respect to the deposit. Okay, up to 100,000 euro, okay, which is the limit. Okay. So this is not completely adopted yet, uh, but let's say it's in a, go in, in a good way. The third pillar, which is the most problematic way, and maybe this is a question you were raising, we created, the European created a wide, unique bank resolution system. So which means two things, common regulations at the European level with respect to bank failure, how do we deal with bank failure, and also how do we solve, solve, the, so solve the bank in case we decide to bail them in. And a, a European fund for resolution is created, okay, with European money put on that, taxation of banks, okay. But the problem is that the German people stop, well, do not, are not very cooperative on this issue because they don't want to pay for the banks in Southern Europe countries. This is ba basically the problem. L like they don't want to pay for the Greek debt, they don't want to pay for the, the the Greek banks or the Italian banks, which are not, as you know, in very good shape. So, so far, the, the German is, are not very much in favor of this system, although they accepted, they, they signed for, for, the, for the European Union, but, banking union, but they don't, uh, so, so far this pillar is not, is not put into effect yet. But that, 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 what is, that was what's presented. So, this is a progress, clearly, because we have a, a more, global, homogenized, coordinated approach, okay? But uh, there is problem. The problem, uh, I will come back to that, is the Brexit, for instance. Because, as you may know, a lot of European continental euro banks are going to London, making a lot of operations in euros, okay? And, and outside, in fact, will be outside the eurozone when the Brexit will, t will come into action, okay? And, Euro I'm sorry, the European Union, okay? So we don't know yet how it will work. Uh, we did not also, there is also a big, a big failure, I mean, at least a big deception for me and for many other economists, is that the Euro European countries did not change or did not make what we call a reform of the banking structure by uh, reforming the Euro universal banking model. We had a report uh, called the Likanen Report. Mr. Likanen was at the head of the Finnish bank, Central Bank. So he headed a report to prepare a separation of the universal banks. So the idea is to have on one side deposit banks or retail banks, if you want. On the other side, completely separated investment banks, as was done by the Glass-Steagall Act in the, in the US in the 30s. Okay? The political decision was made to abandon this. As I will see in a moment, uh, we had two different commissions, the European Commission head by Mr. Barroso with a French commissioner, Mr. Barnier, uh, was in favor of separation, and the new commission head by Mr. Juncker, now with uh, other people, more liberal people, abandoned completely this idea of separation. So we don't know where we stand yet with respect to this question of uh, reform of bank bank structure, but I'm afraid that this idea of separation has been abandoned. Now, let, let's go in the third and last part of my presentation. That's okay? 
let's go on the future. For me, for many reasons, or for some simple reasons also, it's very clear that the effectiveness of the post-crisis financial regulation I just presented a few minutes ago has been v is very uncertain. So we talk about the Dodd-Frank Act, for instance, about the European Union, banking union, but even for, ba for Basel, there is a lot of resistance on the bank, on the part of the banks to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to implement this regulation. So there is a big problem. Today I will mention to you two major problems, two major threats, which are uh, today very important. One of them I, I mentioned already uh, is a shadow banking system. And already, which are not solved completely, which are completely left aside in the, in the, in the, in the present situation. And also, let's put into the picture uh, political, the political situation in the world. In the US, but also in Europe, we had recent elections in the US, in the EU, and also the question of the Brexit, which are all pushing toward a new cycle of financial deregulation. And this is, for me, one of the major threats also of the future, is that we, are, we may, are, may be going into a new cycle of deregulation, while it is more than likely that a new financial crisis is coming ahead of us. So we are in a very, very, uh, well, let's say, dangerous situation to many. So <coughs> the two major threats I see now is the question of the global debt in the world economy, which has not been dealt at all by authorities, by governments, and also the question of the fact that a lot of banks, a lot of banking systems are all are still under strong pressure. In other words, are very on borderline, very on the border of failure. Okay? And this, for me, is a very uh, dangerous situation. And besides that, we have a, a situation where the growth of GDP and investment is going down, is slowing down. This is also another problem. I mentioned to that we'll have probably a future increase in interest rates started already in the US. We have a lot of problems, macroeconomic problems, financial problems, which are going to interfere, probably, and to show that finan financial deregulation, all this will play together in a very dangerous way in the future. What about global debt? One, but maybe the most important feature of the financial system today is the global debt, is the evolution of global debt. Since the crisis of 2007, we had no reduction in debt in all sectors and in all, almost all parts of the, of the world. For instance, here I found that a last report by McKinsey, which is a made very interesting report uh, on debt. And this is what does this uh, diagram shows. You see, for instance, this is a total debt of the, in the world related to GDP in percentage. Let's look, for instance, at 2007, okay, just before the crisis, if you will. You could see that the debt was you'd see, more than 200% of GDP in the world. Now, look, the debt increased, increased. Maybe there is a kind of stagnation now recently, small increase, but the level, global level of debt in terms of level of GDP, percentage of GDP, has been increasing. And you can see that all sectors have been concerned. Household sector, look at the debt of household. This is billions of dollars. You can see that this is 2007, 31 billion, trillion for household, 43 in 2017. Okay, look at, how, at the corporate sector, okay, 37, now we are 66 trillion. Okay, government sector, it's not a surprise, 29, now we are about 60. Okay, trillion. This is all, all countries, all region included, of course. Eh? So this gives you an idea of the problem. The problem for me, now I give you my uh, analysis. For me, the most dangerous situation lies here, in the corporate sector. It's not in the household sector, although we, had, we have still some problems in some countries in the real estate sector, although we have a lot of countries with a lot of, of government debt, but it seems to me that it is in the, basically in the 
corporate sector. Why? Because in the corporate sector, you, had a, we, you have now a bubble in the sense that the rate of increase of issuance of bonds, corporate bonds, is high. The level, the price, if you, if you will, if you prefer, of the bonds, the corporate bonds are being high, going fastly, very fast. And the BIS, the Bank of International Settlement, every year, since the three last years, says, very, be careful, there is a huge problem here. Why? Why? It be, for two or three reasons. One of the reasons is that we have um, a slowdown of economic activity in most regions of the world, including China, which was very fast, and also of investment, and also of expected returns, on, on prof, prof, if you will, profit, if you prefer. So there is uh, some uh, fragility in the, in the business sector now. If, if you add to that the trend toward a rise, an increase in interest rate in the world, due to the policy of the central banks, in particular the Fed Reserve Reserve, which is increasing slowly but surely interest rate, and ECB will do that maybe next year. We may have a, a, a burst, a big burst of the bubble in the future due to that. If there is a political event, if there is a, a, a beginning of some failure of some banks in some part of the world, we may have a panic. And the panic will we may take place in on the on the on the bond se on the bond sector uh, on the corporate bond sector this is my guess i hope i'm wrong of course but i can be more precise Mac the mckinsey report they say that if you look at i'm sorry it's not very clear but you you'll have the powerpoint the title is very clear if you look at emerging countries okay you can see that in most countries you have a lot of problems okay and uh, you have, uh, for instance, in China, for instance, you have, a, you have also other developing countries. You have the perspective, probably, of having uh, a problem with the corporate bond sector. Okay? It's not only in the US, not only in Western Europe, but also in developing countries, emerging countries. This, this is new, because in the previ previ previous crisis, it was only among advanced economies, US, Europe, Japan. But here we are in a more global situation, OK? So this is another thing. Now, if you look at the emerging economy, look at this estimate by McKinsey. Of course, this is a, it can be challenged. They say that in the coming years, 30 to 40% of corporate bonds may be at risk of default if interest rates increase. In other words, if there is a trend in increase in interest rates, they, will be, they may have a panic at some point, on the corporate bond sector, in particular starting in emerging countries where you have more risk. I don't know if you are aware of the mechanics of the corporate bonds system sector. You know that there is an inverse relationship between the return on bonds and the price of bonds. In other words, it is easy to understand. If at one point interest rates are raising, Okay? It means that the future returns on bonds are going to be higher. What is the rational behavior of an investment fund who holds a lot of bonds? Is to sell the old bonds, the returns of which are lower than the future. And if too many investment funds are selling their bonds, then we have a crash on the corporate bond sector. So, this is a mechanic which can be in play in, in the future. It is a very, very dangerous. We are on the edge of a volcano. Some people use this image also. We are in a very difficult situation. And if you look at what, says, what, are said, what is said by the authorities, by the government, you, they almost say nothing about the debt, about the way to try to stop, to tackle this question of the debt increase. And this is very, very... Uh, well, it, it gives you a lot of uh, anxiety. Myself, I'm very upset about that. It, for me, it's the major problem today, and it doesn't seem that the government, the authorities, at the IMF, the IMF and the BIS are saying yes. They are whistleblowers. They say yes, there is a problem, but they are the only one to say something. Governments do, do not 
do not seem to be concerned by that, and as well as also uh, authorities like the ECB, for instance, Central Bank, they do not communicate too much on that. That's a, that for me, that's a problem. So, what I suggest is that you should watch this question uh, in the form for coming month because we may we may have surprise on that. By the way, if you, one of you want to make a, an interesting study for uh, for your for your master, this is a good good field where you can uh, you can work the question of debt, in particular in corporate debt, because I think it's something new, it's something important today, it's something strategic, so it's a good good uh, a good topic. <coughs> now, for me today, and this is uh, why I'm very pessi fairly pessimistic, it seems that a mo lot of countries are trapped what in what I call a vicious circle. In many countries and regions, not only Europe but also advanced economy, uh, Europe, emergent economy, we are trapped in a vicious circle due to the fact that we have we came into a new we are coming into a new regime of slower growth of slower inflation and rising interest rates. I don't know if some other lectures, some of the professors mentioned this to you. For me, it's we, we are coming into a new, what we may, may, I may call a new growth regime since the crisis. A growth regime characterized by slower growth, lower rate of interest inflation, and now, starting from now, or from recent years, a trend towards rising interest rates. The co this cocktail leads to a big problem with respect to debt, to, to debt, to debt. Because when you have a rising level of debt and GDP and inflation are slow, then the ratio is increasing faster. Okay? And if besides that you have raising interest rates, it means that you have to pay more and more for your debt in terms of interest rate, then you, you will have a, you know, explosive situation in terms of debt. And here I make a comparison with uh, the, the, the two previous periods, the pre-war pre, pre pre period, the 30s and the post-war period. In the 30s, we had already a situation which was very well described by Irving Fisher, which was, he was called a debt deflation vicious circle, where a, a good number of countries, US, UK, France, Germany, had a good le high level of debt, but they were in trouble because at that time there was a f low growth, low inflation. Of course, it's more dra it was more dramatic than it is today because y you, you had a different situation, but this was a problem. But more important is what happened after World War II. After World War II, European countries like Great Britain, France, Germany had a huge level of debt, in particular of public debt, which was over 30%, 300% of GDP. But what happened after the war? We had a very high, fast level process of deleveraging because we had a high level of nominal growth of GDP, high real growth and high level of inflation. And in within 10 years, most of the weight of the debt was eliminated because of this high level of growth, nominal growth. Today, we are in an opposite situation in the world. We have a fairly low level of, in, of, of, of growth and a fairly low level of inflation besides raising, rising interest rates. So this is why I do think that this question of debt is a real, a real, a real problem. Okay? Now, Another threat is the banking systems. <coughs> we, we think, a good number of economists today I think that a lot of banks in the world are still in trouble. Fortunately, if I look to the French banks, it doesn't seem to be the case with major French banks. But for instance, in, if you look, go to Germany, the Dutch bank is still in deep trouble. If you look, go to Italy, you have a good number of banks, medium-sized banks, which are in big trouble, which are almost in a situation of failure. If you go to Japan, you also have problems. If you go now to China, you have a lot of banks, which are sometimes public banks, regional public banks, which are in trouble, okay, because they have been spending too much, lending too much to the real estate sector in particular. You have a bubble there. So in some part of the world, you have banks which are in trouble, which means that this may be a spot where 
the new banking crisis can, can start from. Okay? We don't know where, but some countries are not in very good shape, including Europe. Including Europe okay? So uh, this is, a, this is a, a problem. And one of the reasons why they have, we have problems is that a lot of these banks have a lot of non-performing loans in their balance sheet, what we call sometimes bad debts, and the balance sheet has not been cleaned completely. Okay? So this is one of the reasons why they are very fragile, very weak, in very difficult situation. And another problem, I mention it again, is that the government, this answer to your question about the political will, it seems that the government and the financial authority did not, do not have the will or did not, have a, did not decide yet to do something about shadow banking system. And this is a problem because uh, maybe in China it's, it's not the case, from what I know. Chinese authority seems to be to try to do something to deal with this question of, of shadow banking system. But in Europe, I don't see anything specific about that. So here there is a, a problem. Bon. Now, the, the large banks too big to fail are still, are still in trouble, a lot of them in, in the world. And you know what the notion of what we call systemic banks? A systemic bank is a bank which, if, if it gets into failure, can provoke a systemic risk, that is a, a collapse to a whole banking system, due to its size, but also due to its connections with other banks. And this, today we have some countries, like including Germany, including, uh, including Italy, where we have such banks in, in in, in, in difficulty. So we can say that we have a growing systemic risk, for instance, in Europe. Okay. Now, this table shows you what are the major banks looking at the size of their balance sheets. The new thing compared to what, what was the situation just before the subprime crisis is that the world banking system is dominated by Chinese banks. Look here, one, two, three, Four, five, one, two, three, four, four banks, I'm sorry, among the largest banks, the first largest bank in the world are Chinese banks. European banks are coming afterwards, or US banks, or Japanese banks are coming afterwards. This is a huge change. It means that the, the, the logic of the banking system is changing because among these banks, you have public banks as well as private banks. So this may mean new forms of regulation because the Chinese authorities, when they will deal with international financial regulation, will not necessarily have the same ideas of the British, or the French, <coughs> of the German. So it's going to be a problem for the future regulation of the banking system. OK, I will go faster. Now, I will end up with the political dimension of the problem. The recent elections. We had recent votes which are very uh, problematic with respect to financial stability, to some extent, to large extent. The Brexit vote, and not only, of course, financial stability, but the Brexit vote, the Trump election, okay, the two of them taking place in 2016, and in Europe, election in France with Mr. Macron, which is for me problematic with respect to the question of financial stability, and election in Germany, where you have new, a new, uh, new, not a new coalition, but a new government deal, which is more, much more liberal, going toward more regulation, deregulation. Now, Mr. Trump uh, have appointed people which are very much on the lib libertarian side, the Wall Street side. So we are very much in favor of deregulation. Okay? Now, Trump wants to roll back a large part of the, as I said, the Dodd-Frank Act, reduce the power, for instance, of the Consumer Banking Bureau, Bank Liquidation Authority, and so on. Also the Volcker Rule I mentioned. What about the Brexit? The, the, the Brexit, what would be the consequence of the Brexit with respect to uh, financial regulation and financial stability? It seems to me that now there is a kind of alliance between the US and Great Britain to create a space, a financial space, which would, be, which would be largely deregulated to compete with other financial spaces like continental Europe or maybe emerging country spaces. Okay? So we have a global uh, regulatory 
competition which may be taking place in the future due to this change, the geopolitical change due to elections, okay? And this may push, and this will push according to my view, to, towards the sense of deregulation. Because if a country like France or Germany decide to reinforce regulation, financial regulation, banks will lose, will escape, will get out of, of, this, of Germany and will go to the city, for instance. To Great Britain. So now, what is the game played by Mrs. Merkel and Mr. Macron is to try to take advantage of the of the uh, of the Brexit election, okay, to 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 attract financial actors in your continental Europe, okay, to say, look, we don't know what will happen in the future in Great Britain because Brexit creates a lot of uncertainty political uncertainty and so on. We have strong government. We know what we do. We have good regulation. Come, come to, to, to our place. By the way, H HSBC, how do you call it? HSBC? HSBC, who is very well rooted in France, decided to have its headquarter in Paris. This was said, yes, big victory for France. Okay? So Mr. Macron is doing all he can to attract the business sector, and there is also a competition between Frankfurt and Paris, because Frankfurt is where you have the ECB, and Paris, of course, supposed to be a big place to attract new, to attract new financial uh, actors. And you can be sure that the major argument for attracting new financial actors is deregulation. It's not more regulation, because financial actors want less regulation. So this is a huge problem. Okay, now another issue regards Europe, which makes me, makes me not make, for which I'm not very optimistic. As I said before, we had a commission, the Barroso Barnier Commission. We decided to implement the European Banking Union based on two ideas. One, European system is bank based, so we have to regulate first the banks. Second, we are in favor of strong, fairly strong regulation. Another commission came, which is the Juncker uh, uh, Commission. Okay, I didn't put it here somewhere. Okay. Yeah. Oh, last line. What is it? Draghi after. Okay, Juncker Commission. He thinks that we should push for a market-based instead of bank-based financial system and. He thinks that we should have a, a more competitive financial markets for more competitive. And this is why Mr. Um, Jonathan Hill, who was a previous British commissioner in the Juncker Commission, pushed for the what they call the European Capital Market Union, in being more important than the European Banking Union. In other words, to push the European system as a whole toward uh, 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 European market union and not European banking union. This makes a difference in terms of liberalization because if you push for a European market union, it means that you are going to liberalize, for instance, securitization, you are going to liberalize financial markets and so on. And Jonathan Hill, uh, who used to be a lobbyist, by the way, of the city uh, before becoming a commissioner, has had to resign after the Brexit vote because he was a British commissioner. But the guy, I don't recall him, from Estonia, I think, who, re who, who took his place as a commissioner in charge of uh, financial issues, is a very liberal guy also. So now there is a kind of change in, in policies, in the European, European uh, policies, with a market-based system, market, uh, in favor of the market system. Okay? And this is why uh, I'm not very, very optimistic. And I think in the future, we may have big problems. Now, I will go uh, faster. You will look at my, uh, at my uh, slides. In France, Mr. Mar Macron, as I mentioned before, is a member of the financial elites. And he thinks that it, he made official declaration saying that banks are too much, too tightly regulated. So he's clearly in favor of more deregulation, of some kind of deregulation. Okay? And also, he wants to include the role of governments for financial regulation. Why is this important? 
In the past, you had some kind of independency of the financial authorities or the central banks with respect to the government. Mr. Macron is not very clear on that. He says the banks, the central banks, and the uh, authorities are pushing too much for regulation. So I think it's the role of the government to control them more than we, they did in the past. So here we have something new. In Germany, this is wrong on my slide because we, are, we don't have a new government coalition. In fact, we have a CDU, um, SPD, Democrat coalition, but the liberal coalition did not work finally. So, but it, although it's the same coalition as the previous one with the CDU and the Social de Democrats, the, if you look at the program, it's a more liberal program. Why? Because the Social Democrats lost a lot of votes, are very weak now in the coalition, and are not in, in a position to impose a, more strong, a stronger regulation, which was the, the case in the previous coalition. So the interpretation I give, because I, I talked to some German economists about that, the interpretation can be given, can be, we can say that it, it is likely that the new coalition will have a more liberalized, more liberal approach to financial regulation. In other words, will not be opposed to some kind of financial deregulation. Of course, we don't know yet what will happen, but this is a problem. Okay? Now, I will conclude and then we'll stop. Uh, as you can say, we have a lot of dimension of which interfere with financial regulation. The different types of structure you have in different countries. The different policies, which are also related, of course, which are endogenous with respect to the financial structures. We have also uh, new elections, which change a lot of things in terms of uh, the view that governments have today with respect to regulation. We have also a kind of uh, global uh, geo geo geopolitical situation, which has been changing a lot and which may lead to a new way of approaching the question of regulation. One of the dimensions is that we have uh, today a, a multipolar globalization. In the past, the globalization was led by the US, or what we call the triad, US, Europe, Japan. Today, it's not the case anymore. Japan is becoming is a weak country in terms, at least in financial terms. F Europe is in trouble also. US is not very clear about its policy. He wants to dominate, but also he wants to do its own policy, to close its frontier, and so on. So the role of the future role of the US is not very clear at the international level. So we have a very, this is why we have a lot of uncertainty. What, what will be the future? From my point of view, we, we are going toward a trend toward more, de, more, de, more deregulation, because probably the, the war or the, the struggle which we'll have, we will have between the different parts of the world will push toward more deregulation. Even though the Chinese authority are in favor of strong regulation, I'm not sure that they will succeed in uh, imposing at the world level you know, a, a strict uh, type of regulation for the banking system. But of course, this is it's very difficult to, 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 to say that. And for me, there is a risk of financial instability, and which is very high today, not only because of the geopolitical instability, but because uh, of new phenomena like the question of debt, which I would put in front you know, of the major problems, because it seems to me that this problem is huge. It's global. You can see that it takes part, place in all parts of the world. It concerns all major types of actors, banks, business sector, governments. And we don't see any coordinated policy at the world level, in spite of the, of the alerts put forward by uh, IMF or BIS. The government do not seem to be preoccupied by that. So maybe, maybe, it mean, maybe they are right. But I'm afraid uh, it's not that simple. And don't, so we have to be very, very careful. This is a very hot issue, this question of debt. So I will stop here. And thank you. <clears throat> so. so let's start.
side to have some questions and discussions. Please. Um, when you were talking about the increase or the potential sources of new um, regulations, I think you forgot an important um, thing that has just come up recently, which is um, in terms of deregulation by European supervision, so by the European Systemic uh, Risk Board, for example, they have put forward this year a proposal for Europe, Eurobond, which are actually derivatives, and they ask for um, the deregulation in terms of derivatives in order to enable this product to increase European integration. So I think that's an important consideration as well. Well, yes, I didn't mention that, but uh, I think this measure, or this proposal by the European Commission, goes in the same direction that I mentioned about the new the existing com European Commission by, led by Mr. Junk. In other words, they are very much in favor of financial deregulation, and they think, for me, it's something which I hardly understand or can hardly accept. They think that financial deregulation can be a very efficient means of pushing forward European integration. Okay? In other words, European integration by more financial integration, by more financial liberalization. I, I, have a, I hold a, an opposite view, which is that if we uh, deregulate financial markets or big banks, for instance, uh, we are going to have in the future, we don't know when exactly, but certainly we'll have uh, financial instability. And this will work against financial, uh, European integration. One of the reasons is that all countries in Europe are not at the same level of uh, financial development, are not at the same level of financial regulation, so it's going to be a big mess. So I, I can't understand this. This is a, clearly what I may call the neoliberal view of Europe, which is a very dangerous way. Of building Europe. That's the view of Mr. Juncker <coughs> and the Commission. The, present, the, the, commission. the previous Commission, I didn't, I didn't like too much Mr. Barroso because I think he's a fairly corrupted man. You see what he did when he left, he lost, he left, he left the Commission, he went right away to work with the bank and so on. So this guy is uh, he asked to he try to use his uh, influence as a previous head of the Commission to, to push him to make some lobbyism. So, which is something I cannot accept, of course. But Mr. Barnier, it's not because he's a French guy, he's a right-wing person, but he's a very, the, the, the tradition of the Gaullist, right-wing, internationalist people. In other words, they think that we need further, further regulation to improve the working of the European system, the European as a whole. And I think he's right, in the right direction, but today, uh, political forces, in, in dominant political forces in Europe, in, in France, not, not in particular in, in Germany, push towards this idea of more liberalization. And that's uh, and one of the reasons is not the only one. The two reasons that the new elections, which are going to want more right-wing liberal government, but also uh, the pressure, international pressure for the regulation, due to the Brexit and the, see, the policy implemented by Mr. Trump with respect to financial regulation. So this is why we have this type of, story, this type of situation. Yes? Uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Babur. I am from Option B. I have a question about uh, shadow banking. You were uh, talking quite a lot about this and I enjoyed the discussion. And uh, you said like the shadow banking system is quite uh, present uh, in Asia and in, in the West, yes. but in the countries of the Persian Gulf, the Islamic banking yes. system, uh, what kind of parallels would you draw between Islamic banking and shadow banking? Oh, that's a hard question. I had the pleasure to, uh, to be the director of two doctoral dissertations on Islamic banking, so I know a little bit about Islamic banking. And I would, it's difficult because I don't know this, this was four or five years ago. So maybe big change has appeared recently. I don't know. But for me, from what I understand from Islamic banking, it is a fairly regulated Islamic banking. So it's not, it has nothing to do with this idea of which is behind 
shadow banking where you have banks which want to escape from regulation. So I would say there is no, or it's not, there is no relationship between the two. But it may be the case that now, or recent, in recent years, I mean, I don't know, in countries of the Gulf, you may have uh, new, new forms of finance uh, in Islamic countries, which are close to uh, that, that kind, different kind of shadow banking. I don't know. I don't think. I don't think. I don't see why this would happen. But why not? Since I didn't follow up uh, recently, what's going on? And maybe I'm wrong. But, uh, so I, I, my my first answer would be there is no relationship between Islamic banking on the country and shadow banking. But I don't know. This, this, this answer is, is uh, acceptable for you. Okay. Yes. I think my colleague was first. Uh, uh, your colleague, no. This one. Which colleague? I mean, this one, right? yeah. 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 You want to talk? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm wondering, um, every time uh, post uh literature about finance, we hear about, uh, that's what we say, uh, about regulation and financial stability, and like never did I see anything which actually uh, detailed and defined what financial stability is. Are you talking about resilience? If you're talking about resilience on what market, concerning what assets, or like, like I don't understand exactly what okay. is the goal of post in America. Okay, oh, it's not only a post We can define financial stability. The problem is, this is why it's very difficult to fight against it. It takes a lot of different forms. It can be <coughs> bank failures, in other words, uh, Collapse of banks. No, no not instability. Stability. stability. Ah. What do you mean by stability? Okay. Stability is the uh, fact that the banking system and the financial system is able to work and to provide its functions in a very uh, regular way without any uh, interruption. Because what is, you can, it's impossible to define stability without saying a word about instability. Since stability is a situation without instability. So, in other words, the banking system performs correctly, it works, uh, no bank failure, and the financial markets work correctly, no, bubble, no bubbles, for instance, in the financial sector, in the markets, in real estate market, in bond market, and so on. And then you have a fairly stable situation, although you may have volatility in the market, which is uh, something which is. Always existed, which is a characteristic of financial markets. But <coughs> so, the, I would say that two major parts of the financial sector, that is the financial market and banks or invest, investment banks, let's say, are performing correctly their job without any uh, disruption in the in the working. And the disruption, which is instability, comes from bank failure. Uh, in the side of the bank and bubble, a burst of bubble in the, in, the, in the side of the market. Okay? Now, it's not, in, it's not sufficient to, to deal with the question of stability or instability. The question is, do the financial sector perform correctly its role with respect to the economy, in particular to the financing of the real economy? This is the important question. And the, you, the question is to know whereas banks, as they perform today, are providing the financing of the firms, in particular medium and small size firms, do they provide enough financing also to the government sector and so to, to some extent? Okay. And also, do they, uh, this is the first function of, uh, of the banking and financial sector, but another function is to uh, manage risk. In other words, one of the role, major role of banks or financial markets is to be able to evaluate and also to manage the risk. In, and we, we, very often we forget that banks, for instance, not only they lend to firms, and to, to, they also ask when they lend to, both to evaluate risk and to take a part of the risk. And this is something which is uh, which is very, very, um, very important. And when banks take too much, too much risk uh, because they want to make more return, for instance, or because they are making mistakes, this can happen. Then 
there is a disruption in the system and more later or sooner or later this will lead to, to instability. And talking about uh, Islamic banks, what I think interesting in Islamic banks is that you have some products where you have an interesting sharing of risk between the borrower and the lender. In other words, sharing of risk means that when things go well and there are profits, profits go not only to banks which make ret high return, but also to the firm which is taking advantage of the, of the, of the loan. And in case, that in bad times, when there are difficulties, the bank, in the traditional banking system in Europe, for instance, is assuming most of the risk and not the, not, not the, the borrower. It should be the case that firms also, when they are, should be sharing the risk and in bad times, but as well in good times. And this is, this is something which should, uh, should be put to uh, implemented in our banking system, which is not the case. Whereas in Islamic banks, uh, in part, there is this idea of sharing risk. Um, and this is uh, something which is uh, an idea which is very interesting for me. I don't know if I this answer your question. So stability is one aspect. We cannot de be defined without referring to instability. And <coughs> stability is not the only problem. <coughs> We should be careful to what, <coughs> what is the role of finance. Does this play correctly its role in two dimensions? One is financing the economy. And <coughs> second role is also uh, taking risk and eventually sharing risk with other actors. If I can just summarize to say if I, if I understood correctly what you yes. meant. It's like, what do you mean by stability then? It's the fact that they cannot and will never ever be no, any Not crisis. never. No, no, no. We cannot never say. Never. No, but that, that I don't understand. Situation because where you have no, in, no uh, manifestation of instability. That is, you have no bank failures, and you have, for instance, no bubbles. This is a situation of so financial stability so in the banking system or in the financial, or in the financial market. So it's prudential. <coughs> no, it's uh, it can be, it can be uh, purely. Uh, what is a casual observation? Is there a bank? Are there bank failures? Yes or not? If there are bank failures, then you are in a situation of uh, risk and eventually systemic instability. Okay, it can be one bank which is in failure, but it can be the whole system. And you can have also bubbles. In the subprime crisis, you had a real estate bubble, which was behind the, the subprime crisis. So you have financial instability was led to this bubble. And when you, when you don't have a bubble on, on, the, on the market, then you can say that you have a fairly you know, stable financial market. Stable, but not without uh, volatility. You have to be very careful what you mean by stability. In other words, no bubble. But this is my definition. <coughs> I remember before the crisis, the subprime crisis, there were economists who were, were saying, I don't know how you can talk about bubbles I do not know how you can measure and define a bubble. I pretend that you can. I pretend that you can. When you see a market where you have a price of assets, or those markets which are growing very fast during a fairly long period of time, you know that it will go down. And the higher the, the price of assets, the shorter, the more important will be the, the fall. So here you have a bubble. <coughs> and today, you have uh, authorities, central bankers, who think that they can say when there is a bubble or not. But Mr. Greenspan, for instance, before the crisis, was saying, why do you talk about bubbles? I don't know what is a bubble. I think it was very, very surprising to, to, to hear that kind of speech. I think he recognized a few years later that he was wrong. <laughs> <coughs> yes. Um, thank you for this interesting presentation. Yeah. Yeah, I liked it. Um, but there is a part that came up when you talked about, on one hand, about debt yeah. and the uh, global development of that, to increase. And on the other hand, when you talked about financial innovation to avoid regulation. Um, this is when I thought about the other side of that, which is wealth. Yeah. And um, if it's not necessary to just as much as we focus on regulation, 
but we also focus on um, wealth inequality and um, sure. redistribution to take away this this driving force of um, well of deregulation and of, of finan financialization. Um, yeah, to 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 de redistribute such that um, there is less need to avoid regulation and less capital, which is in strong search for high returns. So are you agree? That's just a comment. <laughs> no, <that's laughs> my presentation was not on the roots of the crisis. Okay, but I agree that if you want to get uh, rid of instability and um, financialization and that kind of thing, you have to deal with it. The deep roots of, 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 uh, of the crisis. This crisis is not only a financial crisis, as I said at the beginning of my presentation. It's a social crisis, inequality, ecological crisis, also, and economic crisis. What kind of development model we want, etc. Et so, on. for instance, my view is that one of the major causes of the subprime crisis in the U.S. But it can be also applied to other countries, is a huge growing inequality in the US in the fact that the middle class purchasing power has been declining for two or three decades since the 70s up to the end of the 90s, and that the capitalist system needs that the, the, the demand by household be high enough to buy the product produced by the capitalist unities, the, the firms. So if the purchasing power of wages and so on is going down, the only way to maintain or to have a higher purchasing power is by credit. So the, the, the debt of household in the US can be viewed, the, right, the sharp rise of the debt of household to buy goods, services, ha house, cars and so on, uh, is linked, can be linked to the inequality and uh, to the reduced reduction in the purchasing power of middle class. By the way, many U US economists um, draw this kind of conclusion, this my, not my conclusion. If you look at Krugman, for instance, he wrote a book which is interesting, it's called The Conscience of the Liberal, I think, something like that. In this book, he has a very interesting chapter on that, showing that one of the major changes in the US since the 60s, contrary to what happened in the after war period, during the 50s and the 60s, if you want, be this, this uh, rise in equality, uh, which has been accelerated with um, Mr. Reagan and so on, with a new distribution, new fiscal policy, tax policy, and so on. And uh, one of the major causes of the debt has been, which led to the subprime crisis, has been the inequality and also the, the, part, the, oui, the increase between the, the level of income in the two extremes of the American society. Okay? This is true also in, uh, I would say, in Great Britain to some extent. It is not true to that extent in France. In France, we are one of the countries, Mr. Piketty, for instance, works, I've been showing that, comparing what inequality in France or in the US or in some other country. France, thanks to the, the, what we call the social state, the importance of the social state and public expenditure, not only to invest for investment, but also social protection and so on. We, had a, we have a, a social stabilizer, we call that, which uh, reduced, or we, which prevented the high increase in equality. We have increased in equality, but not as much as in the US or as in Great Britain. Okay. But now things are changing. Mr. Macron is implementing policies which are not very far from what Mr. Trump is doing with respect to taxation, with respect to income, social state, and so on. Or, and so Mr. Trump, uh, Macron is pushing us towards the same type of policies. So uh, I, would, I wanted to say that in France, the increase in debt and financial instability has been less in important in terms of bank failures, financial instability, for instance, eh, has been less important than in the UK or in other countries, in Europe, in Italy, for instance, than the, 
because of the, of the fact that probably one of the reasons is that inequality are not as important. So, to answer completely your question, yes, one, we, if we want to get rid of this type of crisis in its dimen financial dimension, but also social dimension and so on, which are related, we have to take measures and police to have play policies which are dealing with these different dimensions of the, of, the, of the crisis. It's huge tax reduction, which are benefiting to the higher 10% level bracket you know, of income, and not to the rest of the population, on the contrary. So, we, we, we have to have a systemic approach to, uh, to uh, the crisis, which is a systemic crisis, and also to financial instability, which is linked to this systemic crisis. Yes? Thanks for this presentation. I was wondering, um, these regulation discussions, they really tackle what I would call non-international issues, so to speak. Uh, they really focus on either the, mon the monetary union in, the, in Europe, but only, for instance, only the UK, only the US. There's growing literature that tries to draw cartographies of capital flows mm -hmm. from one country to another. And especially in the case of the euro crisis, you can really see that from Germany, from, from Germany, France to a certain extent, they all went through the UK, the US, and then went back in order to... Is there any discussion on the limitation of capital outflows towards these financial sectors that provide services that can avoid, uh, that can avoid you know, regulation, or you know, go beyond the limits posed by bank-based system as we have in Europe? So there are no discussion, or almost no discussion among uh, regulators, except the fact that the IMF, for instance, agrees now that mm, taxation of capital flows, control of capital flows, mm. FTT, financial transfers of tax, may be a good view, may be a good measure. Even, even for developed countries, not only. In particular, for developing countries and for emerging countries. But not for developed countries. No. This is, what, this is what, from what I understand. Okay? But what is interesting is that the European Commission accepted to uh, prepare a, direct, a directive dealing with the FTT, which is uh, one way to, to regulate or to uh, have action to have action on capital flows. Before, it was opposed to that because uh, they, according to the Commission, it would uh, reduce one of the major what they call the, the freedom in Europe, or the major freedom is freedom of circulation of goods, services, people, and flows, capital flows. And so the freedom of capital flows would be stopped, would be uh, reduced uh, if there is an FTT. But it changed its mind. Why did it change its mind? Uh, there are many reasons. One of the reasons is not so much to fight against stability, financial instability or speculation, is because the Commission wants money. Because the European budget is so small, less than 1% of European GDP, the Commission wants to have more money to, uh, to implement its policies. Whereas the government do not necessarily agree with that. The German government is opposed. But one of the reasons why the Commission changed its mind is because it thought that it would be a good way to get more money at the European level to uh, fund the European budget. Just a few little quick follow-up comments on that. The, this idea of tax, I mean, of tax implementations, as you said, won't prevent speculation, but it depends on the on the amount of the tax, of course. But if the amount is minimal, there won't be any. I mean, the effect will be mm -hmm. everything but high and significant. And also, it will make the this potential European budget rely on really unstable proceeds, like what happened in Spain, for instance. All taxes great amount of tax income was based on the housing bubble. If we do have if we have the same for the European budget, it's not really. No, no. So maybe what I'm going to say now is contradictory with what I said just before. <coughs> One of the reasons why I found that the uh, European directive on FTT was interesting is because it was a fairly uh, wide, the base of the taxation was fairly wide because it was including not only regular uh, Taxation, for instance, uh, uh, stocks, taxation on stocks, bonds, and so on, but also the deriv derivative market. So, and one of the reasons why the banks and the financial actors were opposed, strongly opposed to this uh, directive and FTT, is because they, they realized that 
if there was such a taxation on derivative, for instance, they may lose a lot of money. And French banks, for instance, Société Générale, is one of the world leaders in dealing with the stock deri derivative. So it, it was very strongly opposed, and this is why the French government didn't play very well the, the game in, in organizing and negotiating the FTT even before Mr. Macron, because the French banks were very much opposed to it. So it was strange because the Commission was pushing forward the project, which was, if it had it was been applied, may have, have had some interesting and significant impact on, on finance, the financial market, in particular on the derivative market. But what is done now on the market, on the <coughs> derivative market, we just mentioned a few minutes ago before, to liberalize, to help the development of derivative, goes in the, in the opposite direction. So, you know, <coughs> yeah, you have different, if you want to understand why regulation, regulation is not a, a straight line system, a straight line evolution. It, it has, it's changing because it is linked to political forces, the difference of uh, interest in the, in the countries, different countries, elections, result of elections, change in governments, and so on. So we have very, uh, this is why I'm talking about uncertainty about financial regulation. We, we cannot predict what, we, we, what it will be in 10 years from now, for instance. So, and, and this is why it's very difficult to, uh, to, not only to predict, but to analyze what people, government, and so on mean by financial stability. Because the German government would not mean necessarily the same thing as the French government or the, or the Italian government. So it's, uh, that's why it's a very difficult topic. It's a not an easy topic. Yes? Attends, Alain. Yes. You were uh, saying that the loans that uh, the bank gives out uh, can be converted into marketable securities. So what, I'm sorry, can you start uh, again? Yeah. The loans that the banks give out. Uh, the, the loans that are? That the banks develop. Yeah. Yes, they are, can be converted into marketable See. securities. Yes. And you said that 95% of them is converted uh, into a securized uh, I mean financial instrument. So you said that 5% is only included in the balances of the bank. And, mm. uh, but however, you also suggested to increase the number. So on what basis? what is the threshold for increasing the percentage like you said 15 percent would be uh, uh, so the bank would be more creditable accountable in that sense but what is the number how do you come up with the number of 15 percent no it can be 12 percent 17 percent i don't know the idea is to have a proportion of uh, loans that remain in the balance sheet of bank which is high enough so I have to, you have to make a, a study for that. You have to make an expertise, an impact study, and so on. But it seems to most people who are observing the situation saying that 5% seems to be very low to, uh, to have any significant impact on the, on the behavior of banks with respect to securitization. I was thinking more like, it, uh, does it depend on the capital reserve ratio or uh, because it depends also on the skip size of the bank as well. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So, yeah, this is why you have to make a st study or, or using all the different parameters. Parameters: uh, the, what are the rules of the game in terms of capital requirement? What is the, si the size of the banks? In each country, it may not be exactly the same. Uh, securitization is much more developed in the UK than in France, for instance. So you may not have exactly the same results. The same impact in France and in the UK and so on. So I cannot uh, tell you, but what is sure is that it's a good idea to implement new rules that will have some impact, some significant impact on the behavior of banks. In other words, when they lend money to a household for real estate, for instance, operation, if the banks know that you will have to keep a significant proportion of this loan in its balance sheet, and assume the risk of this balance of this loan, it would be more, more careful uh, in lending than if it's not the case, if there is no such rule, because it will know that in six months or one year from now, it can sell, sell on the market this loan, which is a 20 years 
known, but it will keep in its balance sheet only six months or one year. So this is a problem. This is a moral hazard problem. So this, is, this was just a matter of principle. I was just saying that it was a good idea to impose this kind of ratio, but I have the feeling that 5% would not have a significant impact on the behavior of banks. Now, I'm, I have to, we have to work on this. This is the role of regulator to make simulations, eventually stress tests, and so on, to determine what is the correct level of ratio. So, yes, the value and you. Yeah, my question was, uh, what regulation could have prevented 2008? But I think you just said one about uh, balance sheet requirement. But no, yeah. the measure uh, would have been something on the uh, securitization, certainly, to have a, a more restricted view, and also something quite different, the question of separation between business banks and uh, uh, investment bank, if you prefer, and the uh, retail bank. Recall that in the US, the, do, the, the sh 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 what do you call that? Uh, is that the Glass-Steagall Act. Thank you. The Glass-Steagall Act was abolished by under the Clinton administration in the late 90s. And then you had huge banks, which were uh, at the same time banks, insurance, investors, which were at the heart of the new financial system and the dynamic organizing, securitization, and so on. And how do we maintain separation, the glass Eagle Act? It is probable that we will not have such a problem. By the way, some economists, liberal, Keynesian, and so on, wrote papers on that, showing that during the 30 years that followed the last Eagle even more than 30 years, 50 or 60 years, there, was, there has been a lot of, there has been a few, fewer number of bank failures <coughs> in the US, and they attributed that to the, the Glass Eagle Act. So, a contrario, you can say that by abolishing the Glass Eagle Act, you may have followed a situation where the bank would have been in a position to take more risk and to become systemic, so that it would uh, create a pressure on, on the whole financial system by their size and by the interconnection with other banks. So for me, and for a lot of economists now, today, the major reform that should have been implemented after the crisis is the separation. A new, a new glass Eagle Act, if you want. By the way, in France, we had a Stigol Act also, but it was in the post-war period, in the 50s. And it was abolished by a banking law in 1984. So we had also a Act. It was abolished. And in the US, it was <coughs> the way had the same thing. You mentioned La Gauche? Oui. The Paris, c'est les Democrats. In the US, it was the Democrats who abolished this single act. In France, it was the left government. Yes. They lack like finance. La finance, c'est mon ami. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so, when you, I, maybe a question of clarification, I'm not sure though. Um, in your talk, you were talking about the uh, macroeconomic situation of, between, uh, of Germany and Greece, and you were saying that uh, in Germany there is a high, uh, high level of uh, domestic saving, of private saving, whereas Greece is lacking the same. And um, it kind of sounded like that um, you were opting for that Germany should give credit or give their domestic saving to Greece in order to develop or like to help the uh, Greece economic um, situation, which this was kind of confusing me because we were also talking about the endogenous money theory before. So um, I have the feeling this would not uh, work out with the endogenous money theory. And also it kind of reminded me on the, the savings gap models uh, deployed in developed countries before. So I wonder if it was this what you meant or if you are more like saying that we need some kind of fiscal redistribution so that we can have the surplus money from yeah. Germany maybe in, in South and European economies. Okay. No, I was not saying, or maybe I was not very clear on what I was going to say. I didn't say, or I mean, mean, mean to say that the Germans should give their saving to, uh, it doesn't work that way. The first thing is that the German government does not, do not respect, does not respect the regulation, the rules in Europe. The rules in Europe is that uh, current surplus, so you know what is the current account, the current surplus shouldn't be higher than 6% of GDP. Whereas 
the current deficit should be it should be higher than previous time. So already you have an asymmetry in favor of surplus country. And not only that, Germany do not respect the six percent rule of its surplus because it's eight percent now. And nobody says nothing about that. The Commission says nothing. Mr. Juncker has been nominated by Mr. Merkel, by the way. So <laughs> there is a kind of political link between the Commission and Germany, which is um, the most powerful country in, in Europe. So and the French government says nothing about it. Also. So I used to write, maybe I see if I find it, I can send it to you. I wrote, used to write, some German friends asked me to write a paper on this issue. So my answer was the following. It should be the case that Germany should spend more money, private and public, to reduce its saving. Because saving is what this money which is not spent. Okay, in a very Keynesian simple framework. So more public expenditure to stimulate household spending in terms of well, housing, in terms of uh, car and so on, what you want, by stimulating, by small stimulation in terms of with taxation and so on, also redistribution of income, because we know that the propensity to consume of lower income people is much higher than the propensity to consume of high income people. So this is all yeah. top, ba basic and Keynesian type of uh, argumentation. And if we had that, then the rate of growth of Germany would be higher. They would import more goods, okay, from all the partners, France, Greece, Spain, and so on. And this would stimulate growth and employment in the rest of Europe. And the, <coughs> the surplus would be reduced. But the, also the deficit of other countries, like France or Greece would be reduced also, and the huge disequilibrium, macroeconomic disequilibrium we have in, uh, in Europe would be reduced. So the problem is that the German government and the German people, most of the German people, do not think in that terms. They think that if they have a 6%, 8% surplus, it's because they are good, more efficient than others, and others have to do the same. <coughs> but you cannot have it's a, it's, a, it's not that, that way because the deficit of, of some countries are the surplus of other countries. All countries cannot have a surplus. So this is a ridiculous way to think, okay? In terms of macroeconomic terms, in, uh, also in a regional terms, looking at all countries in Europe, for instance. So this is what I think. And uh, if there is also this idea that if we had a more important European budget, uh, an important part of this budget should be devoted to public investment, public investment for the ecological transition, for instance. And here, you will have public investment in many countries, uh, including uh, countries in Southern Europe, which would be very useful uh, to stimulate, of course, growth, but also to help this country to, uh, to be more efficient in fighting, uh, for instance, uh, uh, all these problems we have with the climate, climate change. So this is what I meant. So, I think what I just presented is not is compatible, consistent with the idea of androgynous money theory. And I was not saying we are going to create money for that, decide to create money for that. No, it's, it has to start. This, this is why it's a political problem because it has to be to start with political decision by a government to change its policies with respect to public spending, with respect to taxation, with respect to income distribution, and then. Change things will change. <coughs> yes. Um, hello, my name is Ma my, my name is Matthias. I'm an option B student. Uh, you mentioned at some point uh, that uh, for for dealing and preventing the crisis, we should not only look at the financial part, but also the inequality part. Look, uh, citing the example of US, and uh, I would like to know. Um, well, main which kind of uh, policies in general would, would, would you recommend for it, but especially uh, many, talking about financial institutions, many international institutions, such as World Bank, for example, support an idea that if you uh, put the poor people of, a of, of the country uh, inside the formal bank system, instead of the informal lenders that they usually do, uh, it would help them and help the poor people in reducing inequality. I would like to know uh, your your opinion related to it. 
I'm not sure I understood exactly what. Um, yeah, well, it's a very tricky situ question. I also directed a thesis, uh, which was uh, on the Community Revestment Act in the US in the 90s. The idea of this in the US, the idea is to help um, low-income people and people who are in the informal sector to be able to have a bank to, um, to because if you don't have a bank, you cannot put your money in some securitized space. You cannot have a job sometimes also because you cannot be paid if you don't have a bank and so on, at least in some business firm. And uh, it, it has been shown recently afterwards that the common community relation tax, which is something which is nice by itself, it, look, it looks nice has been of one of the cause of the subprime crisis. Why? It's because by providing facilities to low-income people to borrow money and to go to the banking system, this is, this is this led to over, over indebtedness to these very fragile people who have low income, unstable income, sometimes we are un we are unemployed and so on. And so it is very difficult to find a balance between the the fact that we need to help and to have all people be... For, for me, the bank is a public service. At least the basic act, function of a bank, collect deposit, make loans, and so on, should be as a public service. It should, should be for all people, and it should be at very low cost. Even it should be free for the, lower, the, the, the poorest people of the population. But at the same time, we have to be extremely careful to avoid over indebtedness of low income or unstable income people. The subprime, this is, this is the problem of the subprime. The subprime is the market of, of loan of very risky population. So it's very difficult. So the idea is to have uh, at least some public banks, uh, in large banks, whose function is to collect deposit and to be in contact with this part of the population. In France, we have that, but it's, it, unfortunately, it's been changing. We have what we call La Poste. La Poste is a postal system, which has the function, has the function of providing, collect, collecting deposit, but also providing a payment system uh, to the people, all people, uh, all over the country, even in very small, very small cities, very small, uh, rural part of the country and sometimes it loses money, it money in doing that but it's a public service but at the same time there is a strong strong uh, surveillance of the debt of, this, of the all, all household in particular the, the poor people and the Bank de France Central Bank one of these functions is to, to to be very careful about all the over indebtedness of firms of course but also of household and to to, to uh, to organize negotiation, to avoid uh, people go too far in paying penalties or in getting in trouble because they didn't pay back the loan and so on. So this is what should be done. Uh, but unfortunately, in France now, this we are losing that. The Bank de France is uh, reducing uh, its importance in terms of uh, having, uh, you know, uh, how is this, uh, the guichet open, you know, in all parts of the country to to have the people. Uh, come to them and to discuss the problem of debt. And uh, also the postal system is reducing its number of, uh, of um, what you call that, windows to open, open to the people. And so now we have a, a huge problem of having uh, an important part of the population which is in difficulty because it doesn't have access to the banking services which should be viewed as a public service. So I don't know if this answers your question. Uh, the answer is, I was only in doubt when you said that uh, by putting people into the banking system, you really induce them to get more into debt, or or if you just uh, mainly substitute informal debt by formal debt, because, uh, I mean, of course, by informal debt, you can't have all many statistics and data related to it. Yeah. So, if it's... No, for me, I'm very careful about informal debt, because it can... Uh, in our society, I mean, it can lead to very uh, dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the work of anthropology, 
if you look at the pe people like Moss, for instance, you know, if you know him, you have, if you look at some society which existed in the past, you can see that debt, what we do, has, were very important, informal debt was very important, but it was not so informal than that because the debt was not regulated by authorities, it was regulated by the people themselves and by uh, some social rules. So if the debt is regulated by the people and by social rule, which is accepted by everyone, then there is no problem. But if the debt, uh, informal debt is regulated in a capitalist society like ours, where you have people and firm trying to make money outside, out of, pe of, uh, of poor people, then it's a problem. Then you need to have a strong regulation and to have a severe, you know, severe rules. <coughs> yes, you have another one? Just, okay, you, you, you already asked your question. Yeah, one. Okay, one. <laughs> After, I'm, I'm making a tour. Um, yeah, you can so, come back to you. thanks for the presentation once again. Um, I'll be a bit um, naive and controversial on purpose, but so you mentioned that um, the, the question was not just regulating uh, the financial system and its stability, but also how does it perform its function for the real economy, for society in general. Um, you mentioned, for example, the huge need we have to uh, invest in ecological yes. infrastructure and that kind of things. Um, today we know that um, most, actually most of the businesses that uh, get funded by the financial sector, the, 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 the returns on capital that financial institutions ask are so high that most of the time it leads businesses into bankruptcy and it does not help them to actually uh, get their activities financed. And yeah, about ecological investment, what I meant is these investments by nature are not really investments that are profitable, that are not actually compatible with the logic of uh, interest. Um, my, my question is, um, could we maybe um, think of, um, uh, of an economy without the financial system, without, without that financial system, especially if we do recognize that money is endogenous and with some kind of sovereign money um, policy, the, the fact that uh, like central banks would be able to print money again to, f to fund investment and businesses, um, would it be possible actually for uh, an economy, um, whether is it still capitalist or not, I don't know, but to function without that private financial system in your view? So my, uh, it's a good question. My answer would be that we need in, in the current state of our economic societies, I don't call talk about economy society, I think we need a financial system. But what, what, what do I mean by financial system? It can be uh, banks, central banks, some, time, some kind of regulated financial markets, okay, financing some specific, for instance, for innovation, for new technologies and so on, okay. But the problem now, if you deal with the question of the, the current the existing financial system do not, does not, is not able to provide the financing of the, we are talking about the ecological transition. Why? It's because we need long-term investment. Mm -hmm. And we can see very well that all banking and financial actors today, be they big banks, or they can be also pension funds, mutual funds, and so on, are short-sighted actors, sure. and there is this tight connection between short-sightedness mm -hmm. and high rate of return. Because if you want now, if you want high rate of return, it means that you want to have your money to roll back very quickly, and it, it's inconsistent with long-term investment. So what would be my solution? I've been working on that with some of the colleagues. First, we, are, we wrote a paper recently with a colleague from here, uh, uh, Sandra Rigo, but I don't think you will have her as a professor. She uh, wrote a paper on the short-sightedness of uh, investments, precisely, showing that it now in France and in Europe, most um, actors, in particular investors, but also banks, are not able to finance long-term investment for the ecological transition, that is financial infrastructure, 
financing research mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. renewable energy, for changing the renovation of um, housing and so on. So our proposal is that we, we think it, the, the idea is of new, what we call new form of financial intermediation. What do we mean by new form of financial intermediation? One solution would be to have public development bank in our country. There is one in Germany, by the way, which is only directed toward developing countries. But it's a real public development bank. In Brazil, you have the BNDS. They are killing it. Yeah. They are killing it, of we course. Have. Yes, okay. I'm not surprised. But the idea is to have a public development bank. And in France, we have La Caisse des Dépôts et Conciliation, which is an old financial institution, which they are killing it also. Mr. Macron is doing his job. And, but our proposal is that, because the financial system, as it exists, as it works today, is absolutely unable to finance the ecological transition, to finance long-term investment with very important externalities. Mm -hmm. Because the idea also is that when you finance housing infrastructure, for example, for train to transport goods and not by cars or by bus or by uh, trucks, this has a very important impact on the climate, but the externalities cannot be internalized by the market. So it's, you're losing money if you do that with a business, a private business. So we need to have public actors which are taking into account these externalities and which are able to also to finance long-term investment. So this is a solution for us. But also we think that, talking about regulation, we think that existing prudential regulation with respect to banks, but also to institutional investors, and existing also uh, accounting regulation, accounting framework, is biased, uh, is some, is biased towards short-term behavior. So we show in our paper that, uh, in particular, the back to value accounting system, which is easy to understand, which is based on the short-term evaluation by the market of the balance sheet, but also of the accounting, the results, and so on, is pushed to a very short sight vision of the economy. Mm -hmm. So we think that reform of this accounting system is absolutely necessary if we want to have actors which are more looking at the long-term horizon to, to make their investment. And the paradox, for instance, looking at institutional investors, let's say pension funds, they have a very long-term liability side because the saving which, which is provided by the wealth owners for a whole life long, for many decades, it's a long-term saving. And yet, when they lend their money, they use that money to buy bonds, securities, stocks, they buy that on a very short cycle system. So our view is that it is due to the system of, uh, I want to say that in English, the system of uh, the fact that the managers of the hedge fund give the management to, man to outside managers, which, which are recruited on their performance in terms of return and absolutely not interested in the way, in the sector where investment is taking place. So there is a, a, a perversion of the system today, in the US in particular, that uh, we push the system towards short term, towards not having any interest in the sector. It's only a factor of diversification, but not looking at the fossil energy, renewable energy, it's not a problem. The only question is to have a diversification. So, it's a huge change which takes place and it's very difficult but to start with we need to have to think in terms of new forms of intermediation and for instance to have new uh, public development bank unfortunately in country because in the world today there is a big democratic and political regression uh, in Brazil but also in Europe uh, and this is not very good for the financing of the transition because it need, we need reform which are not reforms that uh, are pushed forward by the current government, Macron government, Trump government, Merkel government, etc. And in Brazil, mm. it's even worse. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I just wanted to say that it seems that financial operations and 
banking operations uh, grow faster or change faster than uh, regulatory institutions do. So to me, there's a question on how uh, or in which issues a regulatory institution should be uh, focusing in. Well, I'll give you the answer. Yeah. Uh, the answer in France, uh, I'm not sure it's the same answer exactly in all countries, is separation. Breaking down this huge financial conglomerate, which has not only a financial power, but also a political power, and also which, has, which are completely uh, distorting competition, because the small banks cannot survive fast facing this huge conglomerate. If you cut them in two or three parts, like Roosevelt did, like De Gaulle did after World War II in France, then you would reduce their size, you would reduce their power, and you would separate you know, private retail bank, which are interested in financing the real economy, medium and small size firms, households, from the one who are interested in speculation, in financial markets, making money with money, and not making money with investment. So, with real investment. So, this is a, the major reform that should be implemented. And in, in Europe, the, 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 the last, the, the banking, the banking uh, rule and laws in Germany and in France, in Spain and so on, they all pretend making this separation. The title of the French bank in, in 2013 is Loi de Separation et de Régulation des Banques. Law for Separation and Regulation of Banques. But in fact, it separates nothing. So it's purely uh, cosmetic. Okay? Because the lobby, the banking lobby was so powerful in preventing from having a true separation that the government, socialist government at that time, uh, did not implement this separation. And it's the same in Germany, it's the same in other countries. So today it's very difficult because the power, the political power of financial <coughs> actors is so big that they, they, there is a, what they call a capture of regulator. The regulator is not uh, able or does not want or does not have the, the will because it's highly connected also with the bank financial system. So this is why we are in a big uh, trouble. And this is why if you look at Roosevelt, if you re read the history in Germany, uh, in the US, I'm sorry, Roosevelt <laughs> had to fight very hard for the last legal right. But he had, he had a victory because he was able to, to fight against the big the lobby at that time. In, in, in our countries, we have the, the, we have the feeling, and not the feeling, but it's obvious that the, the regulators are not independent from the financial system, from the financial system. So the, the radical changes we need, like separation of banks, cannot be implemented because of that. Okay. And this is why also there is a kind of a blindness of the, of the lot of uh, managers of banks or funds because they don't realize that what they're doing is visual business as usual. They do exactly the same business as they did before the crisis. And this business led to the crisis, so, and they, when you tell them that, they do not agree, but they don't realize that it, nothing has changed really. And that, this is my, our view. This is my view, and this, in this uh, department, economics department here, most professors and uh, teach, professors and teachers have, have this view, hold this view, that we have, a, we have failed in implementing uh, regulation. And th this makes a big difference between this big crisis that we had since 2008 and the crisis in the 30s. In the 30s, we had radical reforms after the crisis. Following this crisis, we had no radical reforms. And this is a big, big difference. Because if you compare the big crisis of capitalism in history, you have three big crises. In, in 1870s, at least in Europe, in 1930s in the US and in Europe, and this crisis in the 2000s, if you want. And if you compare this crisis, the, the crisis in the 30s led to some important change in regulation, whereas in this crisis does not. And the, the reason, it's interesting, this could be also a very good topic for a, a thesis. Why? Why do, did we have such important changes in regulation in the 30s? And why don't we have such changes today? It's a, it's a very interesting topic because 
you have many, you have more than one explanation, but economic explanation, political explanation, sociological explanation. Okay, maybe we should stop. <laughs>